My name is Carlo Carrascoso, and I am the director of the Banto Center for Ethical and Purposeful Leadership. The Banto Center is the university's forum for conversation, inquiry, and debate on ethics and leadership as the foundation for excellence in individual and organizational decision making. It is in this light that I would like to welcome you all sincerely to a very important and momentous occasion. Ideas about the purpose of business are not new to our field. In 1932, Berlin and Mean set forth principles of corporate governance that oriented all firm activity towards value creation for shareholders. In 1970, Milton Friedman, the 1976 Memorial Prize, Nobel Memorial Prize winner in, in economics, published his seminal essay arguing that the social responsibility of business is to increase value for shareholders. Business schools, for their part, significantly embrace this script, designing programs and degrees that ensure that students were equipped with the technical training and knowledge to apply this principle within corporations and other similar entities. However, this narrow approach by business schools has recently come under great scrutiny and criticism from many quarters. In a very important essay, the scholar Sumatra Goshal accused business schools of, and I quote, propagating ideologically inspired amoral theories that have actively freed their students from any sense of moral responsibility. Goshal was responding to our collective modern experience, which saw the Ford Pinto case, the Exxon Valdez accident, the collapse of Enron and WorldCom in the early 2000s, the fall of Barings, the 2008 housing market crash that led to the collapse of Bear Stearns, Demon Brothers, and other financial institutions, the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, the Volkswagen emission scandal, the list, yes, definitely seems endless. You may be wondering what business schools can do to change the narrative of business in society, from one where profits to shareholders and investors are hoped against hope to bring about prosperity, and this is the neoclassical economic approach, to where, in the words of stakeholder theorist Edward Freeman, value creation is designed for, created by, and benefits all stakeholders. Being a business ethicist who has studied this throughout his professional career, I am quite excited that today has come. A day where we, as an institution, declare our intent to positively influence and guide the minds of those who have been placed in our trust. Before I go over the agenda for today, kindly allow me to express our sincere appreciation to the benefactors of this event, the Banta family, Randy Walker, Chuck Wilkie, William Mintz, and all others who have steadfastly supported us. I would also like to thank Deans Tom Horan and Steve Woos and their staff for turning an idea of a new school of business and society into a reality in a few short months, including this remarkable event today. And finally, a sincere appreciation to my faculty colleagues who have worked to develop new courses, programs, and ideas with more yet to come. Turning to the agenda today, we will hear from various speakers about who we are, and how we are staying true to our identity as a university through our actions. President Kristen Newkirk will discuss the responsibilities of a university in educating future leaders of society. Dean Tom Horan will explain the university's initiative to explicitly address the challenge of business schools to be a positive force for social good. Our morning keynoters, Judy Samuelson and Elsa Luna, will talk about leadership in a changing world. Dean Steve Woos will analyze the historical links between business schools and the liberal arts and how they form a grounded and yet practical education for our students. 
And then in the afternoon, our panelists, Cindy Elliott, Stephen Bishop, and Didi Odoms, will reflect on geographic information systems for a sustainable society, corporate social responsibility, and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how their experiences with and at the University of Redlands influence them. Without further ado, please welcome President Krista Newkirk, the 12th president of the University of Redlands, and the first female president in university's history. President Newkirk. Thank you, good morning. It is a joy to be with you here today as we celebrate the launch of our School of Business and Society. In my first 100 days as president, I've learned a lot about what makes the University of Redlands a special place. My mask is giving me problems. No. <laughs> Let's try this again. In my first 100 days as president, I've learned a lot about what makes the University of Redlands a special place. Certainly, our long-standing and distinctive approach to business is one of our key strengths. We've been offering business degrees for over 40 years. And now we stand at the beginning of a new and exciting era for business education, one that stresses the interconnections between business and society. Here at the University of Redlands, we do this in a manner that draws upon the broad interdisciplinary nature of liberal arts education as a foundation for a very contemporary skills-based business programs. The result is innovative professional programs that provide both the skills necessary to succeed in business, whether that is at a for-profit, a B corporation, a nonprofit, or in government. And we do this while teaching social values, ethics, and the perspectives to succeed in business and as a person in the world. That is our social responsibility as a university to produce, as the sign says, doers, dreamers, and trailblazers. These are individuals who are not only talented and smart, but they have a passion to make a positive difference in the world. As will be described later this morning by Dean Tom Horan, the School of Business and Society is grounded in seven pillars that constitute the range of contemporary business considerations. These inform the undergraduate, the graduate, and the professional pathways available at the School of Business and Society. I'm particularly pleased with the creation of our new 4 plus 1 program that provides our College of Arts and Sciences undergraduates an expedited pathway to a master's degree in business administration or business analytics. So thank you all for coming to share in this celebration. My thanks to the keynote speakers, Elsa Luna, class of 2004, and Judy Samuelson, who both represent leaders with purpose. To each and every speaker, thank you for taking the time to be a part and to share your expertise. And to all 250 who have registered for this event, trustees, cabinet members, alumni, staff, and corporate partners, thank you for being a part of our Redlands community. Lastly, my thanks to Dean Tom Horan and his team who have led the charge to arrive where we are today, and to Interim Dean Steve Woos and his colleagues in the College of Arts and Sciences for collaborating on this important change at the university. Coming out of my first 100 days, a top priority of mine is to provide our students with the tools they need to be prepared for this rapidly changing world. I commend the university and our School of Business and Society, our leaders, our faculty, and our staff for being trailblazers in creating an integrated, impactful school devoted to better business for a better world. And I invite you to join us as we blaze forward with this new era of business education at the University of Redlands. Thank you so much for having me here today, and I hope you have a wonderful conference. Uh, 
At this point, I'd like to invite Dean Dom Horan to give his remarks. Greetings. I wanted to make sure I had it off in the right way <laughs> before I came here. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, this is a celebration. Uh, this is a celebration of um, many years in the making, uh, and certainly from the time I arrived almost five years ago. It's a new era for the School of Business, and I'm going to describe that new era uh, in a few minutes. But before I do, I do want to as well extend my thanks uh, to many who've made this happen, to my fellow cabinet members, to the president, to the trustees who uh, gave it their enthusiastic thumbs up on May 14th, uh, to the staff that's worked very hard here, to the faculty who've carved out this niche, to our sponsors. Uh, it's just been a terrific uh, family network. Uh, and now to have uh, over 250 representing 170 organizations uh, register for this, it gives us confidence that what we're about is meaningful and worth our time and effort and sweat and tears. So why is it a new era? Well, for those who have been around, you will know that the first era was Whitehead College some 40 years ago. Uh, Redlands was on the vanguard then in providing adult education. The second era, about 20 years later, was the formation of the School of Business. And it's been on a great 20-year ride uh, developing new programs. Uh, uh, not only the MBA, but more recently, the Master's Science of Organizational Leadership, Business, uh, Master's Science of Business Analytics, undergraduate programs, and so forth. So, great second era. Now, we're on to the third era. Now, for those who've been watching, it shouldn't be that great of a surprise. Because in 2018, when we did our strategic plan, we said our mission was to empower our students to impact business and society. And in many ways, this is just right up that arrow, right? To refine our achievement of that mission. You could also see that we had developed a purposeful leadership initiative as a cornerstone to our Masters of Science in Organizational Leadership. You could also see that we had started or expanded a robust relationship with ESRI on GIS and society. You could see that we started to have joint positions such as with CAS, uh, with the Environmental Studies Program. All of these are kind of building blocks into this new era that we celebrate today with the name change, with the commitment to further expand our mission. Now, as I've talked about this, one of the first questions I get is this one. Why? <laughs> Sometimes it's like, why? Uh, and so there are several reasons why. Uh, the first is uh, the outside world, right? The outside world has changed. Uh, it had begun to change uh, before the pandemic in terms of the attitude of business and business organizations, probably culminating in 2019 when the Business Roundtable declared the new purpose of the business as being multifaceted uh, and certainly uh, uh, profitability and return is a cornerstone, but so too is the health of the employees. So too is the uh, supply chains that are fair and sustainable. So too are the communities that the, uh, that the business operate in. So it expanded the line of sight of a business beyond the walls of the office building, right? And into the world in which businesses operate. Then came the pandemic. Once all right, in a century event that challenged us, challenged businesses in the way they operated, in the way they treated their employees, in the way they treated uh, the community around them, uh, and so on and so forth. And if that wasn't enough, uh, we have the other uh, trends and conditions, uh, whether or not it's the rapid change of technology or the economic disruption and particularly the equity or inequity of the economic uh, disruption, what that meant, and the related racial tensions and social tensions that the country has been grappling with. All these things means it's a more complex world. And because of that, 
businesses and therefore business schools need to adapt in their curriculum, in their perspective. And if you look at the business school accreditors, ours and AACSB and uh, ACBSB, so many acronyms, uh, that they, they're saying, what are you doing? What are you doing to amend your upgrade, uh, refine your curriculum to have business students that can not only do accounting and finance and organizational leadership, but do it in this context. And we have been about changing in order to, uh, in order to meet this challenge. Now that's the outside world coming in, right? The inside world going out is that, well, we've been doing it for a while, right? We've been evolving as we, as we move forward. I mentioned uh, what we've done in School of Business. And similarly, in the College of Arts and Sciences, there's been evolution in terms of global business, in terms of other forms, business administration. So we bring a kind of combination that the president alluded to between a broad interdisciplinary liberal arts basis and a honed professional education to take that broad view and turn it into skills, right? That can be very useful, satisfying, and effective for a person's career and life. Now, the, uh, the next question I get, besides why, is, well, what is it? Uh, did, I, did you just change your name, right? No, we have been evolving so that the name is the rightful description of us, but we are going to continue to evolve in a uh, you know, continuous improvement way. And so what we've done is, uh, when somebody says, well, what do you mean by business and society? We hang it on seven pillars. Uh, and I hope the pillars show up. <laughs> yeah, there they are. And you can read about it, too, in this uh, leaflet that's here. So the seven pillars are purposeful leadership and inclusive management, ethical, I've got to look this way to see it, <laughs> ethical decision making, socially responsible practices, data-informed decision making, innovation and entrepreneurship, global and cross-cultural perspectives, and environmental sustainability. So what we've been doing is starting to crosswalk our curriculum and say, how does it stack up relative to these seven pillars? And in some places, it's really strong. In some places, we need to do some more. And that's the continuous improvement side. I want to give you a few examples, though, that just uh, ground these concepts and what we've done. In, uh, uh, purposeful leadership. We started the Masters of Science, which has purposeful leadership as its core. In ethical decision making, we continue to evolve the Banta Center to be not just the Banta Center of Business Ethics, but the Banta Center of Business Ethics and Purposeful Leadership. In, uh, in socially responsible practices, we have required business ethics and society courses throughout our curriculum. We did some market research before we launched and wanted to know you know, are we impose, imposing this or is this, is this inherent? And so we, in the survey, we asked scale one to five, how important were various attributes in their view? Uh, how much did they va value them? And, uh, and, you know, curriculum got about 4.8, but social and ethical responsibility got a 4.2 out of five. And that's without marketing, right? That's inherent in our student body. Uh, our business ethics classes have really had an impact, and the related ethics discussions in our, in our courses. Next, uh, decision making. We have business analytics that, uh, that is a, a very important aspect to it. And then we have, uh, uh, in the area of entrepreneurship and innovation, we have capstone courses that provide a special opportunity to connect and to integrate these various uh, pillars. For example, uh, we're doing one right now, uh, Capstone, which a Capstone MBA strategy, which is being co-taught and co-executed uh, you know, by us at the University of Redlands and CETES in Mexico. And we are looking at the social, economic, and technological development of the Cali Baja region and how to apply Michael Porter's concepts of industry clusters to have economic development that is sustainable. Right, that has a lot of these elements in there. It has you know, data-informed decision-making because we're using GIS. It certainly has uh, uh, ethical leadership and so forth. 
these are the kind of special things that we can do to distinguish ourselves. Uh, in the area of global and cross-cultural perspectives, we have a global you know, uh, a concentration in our MBA. Uh, CAS has a global uh, studies program. We, we do global consultations and, and so forth uh, in, in the global. And then in, under environmental sustainability, in addition to the joint appointment we have uh, with CAS, we have a very strong relationship with ESRI and looking at GIS and society and looking at it from what they say, multi-layered approach. And uh, I'm sure uh, Cindy Elliott from ESRI will have something to say about that later. Uh, and looking at the various economic, social, environmental impacts. So these are our seven. We're working them every day and look forward to reporting further. Uh, it's a step at a time. And so uh, today we'd like to take one more step and if you go to the next slide and announce a $100,000 Redlands ESRI STEM scholarship for underrepresented minorities. This is a way to bring our talents uh, to a wider group of students. And we're very excited. And I want to thank ESRI for their support of this. Thank you. So uh, one more note on. Uh, what else we're doing, we have an accelerated 4 plus 1 uh, uh, degree, which uh, the president referred to. We've had great response to that. We have new certificates in organizational change and business location analytics. We have uh, all our degrees are now available online. That was quite a heroic effort. Uh, we will be working on a doctor of business administration, and we will be exploring interdisciplinary undergraduate programs that are possible. So our job is not done, right? We have a new set of opportunities, tasks, chores, and very much I look forward to working with you uh, on them. Finally, the last question I get, if it's there, is, I'll ask it myself, is who? <laughs> How did I know I was going to say that? Uh, and so, uh, who are you talking about? Uh, well, uh, we're talking about our students, and I already mentioned them, our existing students, and we think an expanded range of students. And you'll see some of those students and alumni today. Uh, Al Alsa Luna uh, will be speaking, and then this afternoon we have two additional alumni speaking. Stephen Bishop uh, will be speaking, and so will Dee Dee Odhams, and others. And there are many alumni uh, in this room that have been supporters, and we very much appreciate that, and appreciate you coming today and the support that you have, that you have given. Uh, we have a, uh, the who includes how highly diverse we are. And in speaking with, uh, with those who've been involved in business and society, enterprises and, and universities, uh, including Judy Samuelson, who will hear shortly, uh, one of the things I remarked is, uh, you know, for a regional university, 51% first generation, 35% Hispanic, to take on this charge in a, such a highly diverse environment and, tr and make it work and make it meaningful and make it authentic is our challenge and I think is a challenge that we are up for uh, doing to perfect that mission that our students can impact business uh, and, and society. And as we thought about who these students are, existing and potential, uh, we came up, we saw that some of our students are understandably very practical, uh, want to get the MBA. Some are aspirational, and there are some mixture in between, right? They want to be the first to, you know, uh, you know to, to finish a, gra a graduate degree, want to have a successful career. And, uh, and, and others are, are kind of are, uh, uh, in between. And so, and if you add up being a doer, being a dreamer, doer times dreamer equals trailblazer, <laughs> right? Because not only the skills, but the passion. And so when we decided how to launch our marketing, uh, we really wanted to have, uh, you'll see it here, you know, aspiring leaders making real work impact, right? Doers, dreamers, and trailblazers. And that's who we think we are. At the uh, uh, homecoming recently, uh, I asked, you know, a lot of alumni, how many of you are doers? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, how many are dreamers? Oh, you know, and uh, how many are trailblazers? There were a few, but they were loud, <laughs> which kind of makes sense for a trailblazer. Uh, and so we feel like we're in good, we're in good stead. 
I'd like to close by just showing you some more of what we've done that you'll see uh, you know, in magazines, on the radio, uh, the ads that we have that are going out, kind of getting this message out uh, that we really believe in and we're excited about uh, uh, having it out there. And finally, I'd like to close with a video that I think pretty much uh, sums up uh, who we are. Over the last several years, it's become clear that businesses need to take an active role in the world that they inhabit. Our mission is to empower our students to positively impact business and society. What we look for employees is the ability to not only bring the skill sets, but they have that same shared value. Really making sure that every aspect of business is being conscious of society. The kinds of issues that businesses are facing these days always involve broader societal considerations. When you look at all the different trends, technology, culture, environment, global forces, we need a business education that can prepare our students for that world. We talk about the societal environment. You can't analyze where a business has been or where it's going to go unless you know what's going on demographically and politically in the legal system. And if you don't understand the societal environment, you're never going to understand the industry you're in. You're never going to understand how that company thrives. We want to educate the next generation of business professionals and business leaders to be ethical leaders. Society is made up of diversity. The challenge is, can businesses be equitable and can they be inclusive? Can they accept that authenticity? Being in the School of Business changed the way that I saw the world. It changed the way that I saw business. It changed the way that I saw my own industry. And it, it allowed me to think differently. We are serious at the School of Business and Society. And we want you to be a partner. This is a new era of business management and business leadership. And it's incumbent upon business schools like ours to prepare students to be those new business leaders here at Redlands. Inclusion, welcome to the new era. Thank you for joining. And now for our next technological feat, <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, see if we can get Judy Samuelson uh, uh, on the screen and, uh, and, and in introduce her. Uh, while we're, uh, let's see if she joined. There she is. Good morning, Judy. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. And we can all see and hear you. Thank you for Great. joining us uh, this morning. Uh, Judy is the founder and executive director of Aspen Institute's Business and Society program and author of a new book. It's right here, Six Rules of Business. Uh, and even I made sure I read chapter eight, Implications for Business Schools. Uh, and it's a, it's a terrific uh, book. Uh, uh, of course, Judy's had a long career as the founder and executive director and several signature programs during her uh, you know, decade-long campaign to develop Aspen Institutes of Principled uh, Long-Term Value Creation and a variety of partnerships uh, with universities and businesses uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, social responsibility or, as she says more broadly, uh, these new rules of business. So Judy, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, the, the screen is yours. Great, thank you. And Thanks to all of you for having me and special congratulations to Dean Horan and to Madam President. Uh, it's a total honor to be here and to be with all the distinguished guests and the faculty and alumni and supporters of this institution. I'm from Southern California, grew up, born and raised and uh, went to college in LA. And um, so I kind of feel like I'm home even though I'm on the other side of the country. I wish I could be here in person today, but let's see if the tech gods are with us here. If I can make this work, are you seeing that? I trust you are, or somebody would come on the mic and tell me we have a problem. So I'm just going to go ahead and use those see. words. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, did you share your screen? So again, glad to be here. Uh, 
and we all wish maybe we could be there. This is a snapshot of the Aspen Institutes, the um, campus in Aspen, Colorado, and it's home base for all the meetings and dialogue that we engage in as an institute. But this is home base for me and has been for many years, New York City. And where this is where my team and I work on these questions about the role of corporations in society. Our work is simply grounded in the belief that corporations are the most important and influential institutions of our day. Think of their power as aligned to the church in the middle ages. Today, they have the talent, the resources, the extraordinary global reach, the problem solving skills. And increasingly, I would say, the will to address the most important problems of our day. This is why I wrote this book. I really wanted to explore what's possible, more the more about the forces that are driving the change, but also the barriers that are holding us back. So I wanna start with a bit of a thought experiment. It's uh, I'm kind of going a little bit out on a limb here. If the corporation is the greatest tool we have to assure our collective survival, then what is the work of business schools? For me, this isn't really hyperbole. It's, it's in essence, the work that animates, it's a kind of idea that animates my work but this assertion that the corporation may be the most important instrument we have to move the needle on critically important issues from climate to growing inequality kind of begs the question, what is the corporation? Why do we, the public, give corporations a license to operate? And how do we ensure that these remarkably important institutions are working on our collective behalf? This question, the question of purpose, and especially the alignment of intentions and operations is at the center of our work. Dean Haran mentioned this moment that is now a couple of years ago when the Business Roundtable, our largest or most influential trade association of the, some of the largest companies in the country, when they took the step of essentially saying, we wanna restate the purpose of the corporation had and kind of adopt this stakeholder view. They found it easy to do because they felt they were already doing it. And yet the question that I'm asked the most today is whether their intentions are real. If we're actually seeing the change in priorities or whether share price is still the most important measure of success. This takes me back to a story that appeared in the New York Times that invited me to first start thinking about the organizing principle for business and the decision rules that still elevate profit maximization above other priorities. This is a, a picture of a uh, cruise line. It's a fantasy picture. It's not a real picture. But it brings me to this story in the New York Times in 1999 that chronicled the egregious behavior of the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line. It's not to pick on them. Other cruise lines suffered from the same uh, challenges. The company, which is founded in Norway but based in Florida, was censured for dumping toxic waste and spent fuel in the Caribbean Sea and the US coastal waters, endangering the coral reefs, the beaches, the sea life that their customers were booking passage to enjoy. Before ships set sail, the waste containment system is inspected. So the dumping was clearly intentional. Dumping spent fuel lightens the load, it saves fuel costs and avoids waste disposal fees back in port it also endangers the ecosystem and is a clear violation of the public trust. The actions for which the Royal Caribbean was censured put both the company's long-term interests and its reputation at risk. So I ask, what was the ship's engineer thinking? Why risk tarnishing your own brand to save money today? Before we leave this slide, I wanna make the point that corporations aren't good or bad. They're not moral or immoral. We experience good and bad results. And oftentimes the good results are things we take for granted. And it's the bad results that earn the headlines. But they're also a collection of the intentions and the purpose. Importantly, it's about what they are designed to do. They deploy these decision rules, incentives, and protocols that signal a lot about the company's real priorities. So this is purpose is a question of law, but it's especially a question of intentions and making sure that we're actually aligning 
the decision making with the long term health of society. Here's a more recent example. I'm not going to spend all the time talking about this, but this is Dieselgate, the scandal that went public in 2015 when we learned that Volkswagen had equipped millions of diesel cars with software that made them appear cleaner during emission tests. This is a long way from the small is beautiful campaign that I grew up with in Poway, California in the 1960s. The magical thinking that a lot, a lot like the cruise liner story, that the real costs of how the product is designed can be borne elsewhere in order to maximize revenues or profits or maybe share price. So it takes me to this moment when we're talking a lot about value extraction, but need to be back on the road to value creation. We're in technology, whether it's Google or Facebook or DoorDash, when we employ contract workers, more than half of Google's employees are contract workers. Who actually pays? Retail. Who bears the cost of business models that are built around price and convenience? VC and private equity. What was the real cost of the predatory pricing enabled at WeWork? Capital markets. When companies are literally borrowing in order to distribute 90% of their profits to shareholders, who pays? We're seeing a lot of these questions asked today. And it takes us to this next slide. What is the real value of a corporation today? I think the most remarkable change since I went to business school is it can no longer be measured on a balance sheet. Intangibles are the real source of value. Things like reputation and trust, access to talent. These words kind of roll off our lips today, but ultimately they're about business continuity and the license to operate. When I graduated from business school in the class of 82, we spent a lot of time talking about financial capital. It really was literally the noise in the room. We also, of course, talked about customers. Human capital was rarely talked about, at least it's only considered really a cost of doing business. And we talked about the material inputs in the supply chain, but not nearly to the extent that we do today. If you fast forward today, that small circle around governance, it wasn't a word that we really used in business school. Today, it's all about governance. It's about decision-making. It's what's called the G in ESG. And all of our conversation today seems to be about human capital, particularly coming off of this pandemic. Ironically, we still spend a lot of time talking about capital markets and the noise from the financial kind of Capital markets in the financial industry, of course, are real and present, and we hear a lot from it. But ironically, financial capital is no longer a scarce resource. In fact, we could all name examples of companies that have gone public in the last couple of years that didn't raise a single dollar in the public markets. They were simply accessing the direct capital for their early investors and allowing them to retire. This leads us to the forces that are shaping the changes in business today that I think are so profound. And that for those of you who work in business that you're likely seeing up close and personal. This is about the fundamental change in valuation. And it defines these forces that are driving change today in business. The rules are subject to a host of shifting norms and responsibilities. Key actors, Tom mentioned in his opening remarks, NGOs, media, the power of the internet. These are able to harness your brand to catalyze change or make some larger point, whether it's about plastics or species extinction or water conservation or climate. McDonald's, my case example here, has been targeted dozens of times and has learned a tough but important lesson. that corporate responsibility is defined far outside the gates and that they're subject to tremendous pressure, but they need to leverage their own market capacity to be part of the solutions to these complicated questions. In other words, they need to lead rather than resist. Here's a point that again, Tom made. He, he could have given this talk. He was right on aligned with what I wanted to be able to talk about. I was happy to hear. But today it's the employees that are the key to accountability. I don't think it's either investors or consumers. It is the most dynamic force of change that we're seeing. The accountability from the cafeteria. 
great, the great, great resignation that everyone is talking about from the employees of Amazon who are using their own shares of stock to bring a shareholder resolution to their employees about the need for change on the climate front, to examples of the shift that are happening daily throughout, throughout companies. I think in a very current example with uh, the breakup of GE just this week or the announcement that GE is gonna be broken into three, pace, three pieces, Alan Murray, the editor of Fortune Magazine, interviewed Larry Culp, the, the CEO who was going to be governing over the, the breakup of this company, this storied company with such a long legacy and who has, which the name has meant so much to our own history as a country. And he said in his interview, Alan Murray says that Larry Culp acknowledged, even though he is defending this breakup and of course thinks it's the way forward, that one thing had changed a lot since Jack Welch's time when he was CEO of GE. And that is the aspiration of employees. So this is a quote out of the New York Times accounting of this today. Increasingly, Alan Murray quotes, Larry Culp is saying, increasingly recruitment and retention is more about the corporate whole. It's about position and purpose. There was a point in time when people said, I wanna work for GE. Today, people are more focused on addressing climate or being in healthcare or in aviation. I think going forward, what we do in recruiting and retention will be a function of what we are doing from the PL. And finally, the third point I'd make when it comes to these new rules is that you can't address complex problems as important or systemic as climate change or inequality or economic mobility or, or a host of other things that may be on your minds in this room. You don't do it one company at a time. In the face of existential risks, risks to our collective survival, co-creation is needed. It trumps competition. So how will the change take place? We've been talking about some of this. It is coming from the top. We have CEOs that are stepping out in force. It's coming from crisis and systemic threats to commerce. It's certainly coming from the internal change agents that you as an institution have pledged to support and equip. So here's a few thoughts to explore as I close up about business education. One of my favorite business um, uh, scholars and leaders is, is Dean Sally Blount, who recently stepped down as Dean of Kellogg School of Management and has served on our advisory board for many years. She's a big fan of the liberal arts and she's a big fan of this experiment that you're engaging in, where you're gonna blend the best of the liberal arts with the best that a business education provides. And what does she say? She says, we need business education to be as robust and broad as possible. I think that's a description of your nine, seven pillars. What's the goal of business schools? What do we want students to learn? What's the impact of a management education on the mindset of managers? These questions open up some of the tensions that business schools need to explore. One of these tensions is in fact the role of finance. It tends to be a loud noise in our economy and of course, it has a lot of real estate and business education. This quote from Ron Fuhar, a columnist at the FT, that wealth creation within the financial markets has become an end in itself rather than a means to the end of shared, uh, means to the end for shared economic prosperity. We need to be asking questions about what we expect from our finance classrooms and whether the skills and tools that they teach are gonna help us move from what works for the individual firm and what works for the collective. Second, how will our graduates measure business success? This is another tension. Those tools that are taught, discounted, um, discounted cash flows and the asset pricing models and these kinds of things, are they taught as a tool? Or do they understand the broader context and that the, the and to, do, do they help us assure that we're drawing from a much broader toolbox when we're equipping our future leaders? To consider the entire ecosystem, what will need to change? 
What else besides this question of firm specific metrics versus the health of the system? We're gonna be need to be challenging the growth paradigm itself. This gets us back again to the mindset of managers and researchers. How will our graduates measure business success? And finally, what skills will our students require? Are they gonna be able to work across functions and in coalitions? Engage and have empathy for the workers? Will they engage in critical thinking and the understanding of systems change? To date, that's been more the provenance of the liberal arts than it has of business schools. So you have an opportunity to bring these together moral courage to challenge conventions that are out of step with long-term value creation, from how we reward executives to the basic posture of business in the public square. And it takes me to this question of sustainability. Sustainability is not an end game, it's a mindset. We never arrive. Which takes me to this picture, which is not from this year's uh, New York City Marathon, but from a couple of years ago, I happened to live a couple of blocks off of the First Avenue part of the, of the marathon, and I get to see it every year. And watching this year reminded me, which was the 50th anniversary of the marathon, reminded me of a slogan on a t-shirt worn by a jogger in Central Park that caught my attention. There is no finish line, the t-shirt said. Exactly. And the design of business and society is a continuous relay, relay race. It really never ends. But I think we see signals now of irreversible forces that are placing us on a stronger footing than when I first started down this race some 25 years ago. The new rules are already written and they're producing real results, but there's no time to lose. And your bold, innovative experiment is arriving just in time to tackle what I think are unprecedented challenges that are facing our world. So I leave you with my best wishes for this next chapter in this critically important educational institution and the remarkably diverse population that you serve. These are in fact ideas worth teaching and I look forward to the work that lies ahead. And with that, thank you very, thank you very stop much. sharing. Thank you very much, Judy. Uh, a terrific uh, presentation, meaningful presentation. Uh, we have uh, one more presentation this morning, and then we're going to open to Q and A for uh, for Judy, for Elsa, and 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 in general. So if. Uh, uh, if you could just stay with us a little while, Judy, that'd be fantastic. Uh, so we're going to hear from a, another perspective, perhaps more of a nonprofit perspective, but not always. Uh, uh, Elsa Luna is the Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operating Officer of KPCC, which we wake up to every morning at 7 o'clock. <laughs> and uh, Elsa has been there uh, since 2016 and is responsible for operations, financial, and administrative activities. Uh, she is an alum of ours, getting her MBA here. Uh, she started out in the uh, public, uh, private sector and then moved her way into various spheres, which are really uh, at the YWCA and then KPCC. She was the uh, 2015 awardee, uh, CFO of the year for the Los Angeles Business Journal, Journal. And in her free time, she spends it with her family, including her daughter, who is here with us today, and her other daughter, who's accepted to be at the University of Redlands in the fall. So uh, we're delighted by that, to hear about that today. And uh, Elsa, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you've been just a great partner for us and an inspiration for many of our students. Thank Elsa you. Luna. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Buenos dias. First, let me say, um, I wanted to start by giving gratitude um, and praise to our brave veterans for your service and for members of the armed forces on what this beautiful Veterans Day is. Thank you. 
I also want to start by saying thank you to President Newkirk and Dean Horan for inviting me to this lunch event. I'm very excited and hope that you find my story weaved into the makeup of what business and society represents for the University of Redlands. When I spoke to Tom about it, um, he asked me to make it a little bit more of a personal story. So, um, you know, I love Judy's presentation, but m mine is a, a very intimate story about who I am, what I represent, and, and hopefully, you know, w w what I'm about as a University of Redlands alumni. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so first and foremost, I identify myself as an Angelina born in Los Angeles from two immigrant parents. My parents are from the state of Oaxaca, Mexico, a southern state. Um, they grew up in two small Pueblo towns, um, one named Yasachi El Bajo and the other Amatlan. To this day, they talk about their towns with pride and describe it as a dreamy place of abundant fruit trees, children running around, women making tortillas, and men tending to the fields. It's quite dreamy. I'm sure it wasn't as dreamy as they described it. My parents identify as indigenous from the Zapotec Indians, known as the Cloud People. The belief is that they descended from supernatural beings who lived among the clouds, and upon death would return back to the clouds. The Zapotec people created a writing system thought to be one of the first writing systems of Meso Mesoamerica and a predecessor of those developed by the Maya, Mistec, and Aztec civilizations. Growing up, I learned about my family's rich culture while tasting spices and foods that to this day make my mouth water. Mole, tamales, champurrado, pan de yema. If you haven't tried Oaxacanian food, I highly recommend it. My parents today speak both Spanish and English, and my dad speaks a dialect called Zapoteco, a remnant of his ancestors. Growing up until the age of five, I only spoke Spanish and learned English once I started school. So one can say I'm an indigenous Mexican-American native to Los Angeles with English as my second language. I consider my upbringing a part of a cross-cultural world that is deeply embedded in the roots of who I am. Growing up, one of my most distinct memories was the work ethic both my parents demonstrated every day. My mom cleaned houses, and my dad, who graduated in a degree in engineering from Mexico, Worked, as a dis worked at a school district as a technician, as a sound technician until the day he retired. One of my most impressionable memories growing up was watching my parents work long hours and come home every night to study English or go to night school. My dad had a cutting board, something that you have in your kitchen, you know, a wooden cutting board. And every night he would pull the cutting board from between the sofa and lay his books and all his work papers on top of it. The edges of the cutting board were, eb were ebonizing from the oils of his hands from handling it every day. Growing up, this was what a desk was to me. I would wish and dream that one day I would have my own cutting board worthy of my studying. Then one day, when I was about eight years old, my dad drove me to the hardware store, and he had me pick out my own cutting board. Super excited, I knew I had arrived. My studying and hard work had warranted my very own cutting board. I spent countless evenings along with my dad, studying with our, with our, each with our own cutting boards. This cutting board represented a dedication to hard work, a routine to studying, and carried all of my books and study papers till the day that I graduated from college. It represented the foundation of what my education was. My dad always told me that having a high work ethic and making smart decisions was key to life and a successful future career. I attended UCLA and graduated with a degree in political science and international relations back in the 90s. 
As many of you probably remember, back then, 1994, there was a ballot initiative that was passed named Proposition 187. It was to establish a state-run citizenship screening, screening system and prohibited undocumented immigrants from using non-emergency health care, public education, and other services from the state. This initiative directly affected many of my classmates and their families. My activism and social responsible light was sparked for me that year. Along with my fellow classmates, we marched and protested all around the city to repeal this new law and let everyone know that no matter your documentation status, that they should be afforded the same rights liberties of education, health care, and basic human services. As many of you know, this was later deemed unconstitutional and was abolished. This activism still lives with me today. We should all be treated with kindness, respect, and basic human dignity. This is a deeply rooted belief that has engined my social responsibility and takes me into the world of nonprofit management. But my first job out of college wasn't in nonprofit. It was in the for-profit world. I worked in a company that did airline catering. Remember airline catering when there was food on the planes? It doesn't exist today. I was a finance director. I was a 22-year-old finance director managing a staff of 12 in payroll, finance, accounting, dispatch. It was a 24-hour, seven-day operation that never slept, and the return was only one line. The bottom line. Profitability was all, was all that was key and what was expected. And it, when it wasn't reaching the goals that the company aspired to, people and products were the first to be expended. At this time, I was a young Latina, freshly out of school. While people saw promise in me, I didn't quite see it in myself. I had a horrible case of what I later learned had a name called imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their skills, talents, accomplishments, and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. Despite external evidence of competence, these experiencing this phenomenon remain convinced that they are frauds and do not deserve all they have achieved. Individuals with this affliction incorrect, incorrectly attribute their success to luck. According to the International Journal of Behavioral Science, an estimated 70% of people feel imposter syndrome at, this, at some point in their life. Anyone here? Because I can't be the only one. Thank you. I was so unhappy in this work environment and the other side of it was the environment created in my head. There had to be a working world out there that creating a profit could be done in conjunction with social good and helping people. A mentor of mine introduced me to the world of nonprofit, where it was first explained to me about a double line return, one for profit and one for social good. Upon hearing this, I knew I had found the external environment that was going to work for me, that was going to solve one of my two problems. Now it was time to work on my internal problem. Who I was at this point? A woman, a Mexican-American, a new mother, a new wife, a college graduate, a career manager, and later, a cancer survivor. Striving to continue to learn all there was to learn. I was hungry to learn. I wanted to learn. All while having deep issues of self-doubt, fear, and anxiety. My next step, I decided to enroll into a graduate MBA program at the University of Redlands. I felt that learning business, finance, leadership would ground me and continue to enrich the real world experience that I was learning every day. This was life changing for me. My cohort of working adults shared their daily struggles 
and we learned from our experiences. I graduated in 2004 with a master's in business administration with my degree in one hand and my baby daughter in the other. I've spent the last 22 years working in the nonprofit sector, focusing on organizations that were about social good, feeding children and senior citizens, helping people find housing, environmental good, working in sciences, specifically out of um, the sciences and space. Educational good by making sure that every three and four year old had basic preschool education and every 16 to 24 -year -old at risk youth had vocational training programs that could get them jobs beyond minimum wage. Today, I work in news and information for all I'm the Chief Financial and Operating Officer at KPCC, Southern California Radio, and KUOR 89.1 that University of Redlands manages. I'd run amiss if I didn't acknowledge one of our trustees, Jim Pick, who's sitting here today, part of our University of Redlands faculty. This is a nonprofit organization dedicated to strengthening the civic and cultural bonds that unite Southern California's diverse community by providing the highest quality news and information across multiple platforms. We are a public forum that engages its audience in an ongoing dialogue of exploration of issues, events, and cultures in the region and in the world. We seek to provide greater understanding and new perspective to the people of these communities and their leaders. Every day in my job, I make sure that operations are running well, profitability is happening, and that double line return that I was told about is happening. I wake up every day thankful that I can contribute to the fabric of what makes Southern California so special by promoting for people who look like me. My experience, education, and now age have eliminated that self-doubt that I carried so long ago. My roots in education today embody my nonprofit work while standing here as a strong Mexican-American woman. I've, just, I've been described many ways in my career. A boss lady, a bulldog, and three that are very special to me that you've heard from this morning. A doer, a dreamer, and a trailblazer. I feel like, truly like a University of Redlands alumni. Thank you for letting me share my story, and I truly hope you got a glimpse of what society means to me. Here I am. Thank you very much, Elsa. Thank you. Very moving. Uh, I think it means a lot to our students and alumni, uh, to us, uh, who have get inspired to hear a story from the heart, values, uh, meaningful success, uh, just tr tremendously inspiring. Uh, so this morning, you've heard a number of perspectives. Uh, our school's perspective, the perspective of uh, the new rules of business, Judy Samuelson, and the perspective of Elsa Luna. So at this point, uh, hopefully we can get Judy back on. Uh, we open it to questions or uh, comments. Uh, there are two mics, I believe, right there. So if you uh, would just make your way to a mic, uh, then we can get the discussion going. Uh, as we await that, I will, okay, there goes Chuck. Uh, uh, Chuck Wilkie, trustee. Uh, Is this on? Yep, thank you, Tom. And thank you, uh, the presentations were terrific this morning. Uh, I have, uh, I was fortunate enough as a trustee to be involved in uh, the discussion about, uh, of all things, we got into a great deal of detail about naming uh, the school, the new school of business, and the society part. And so I, 
Judy, I have a question, I guess, of you, per, uh, maybe, uh, on this. Um, in the midst of that whole discussion we had as trustees, I reached out, I have an MBA from back in the 60s, and I reached out to the dean of the business school I went to on the East Coast, and, and uh, he was very helpful, and I asked him about how we were thinking about positioning the School of Business and Society and about the society part, and his response, I was thinking, sitting here, um, that, that struck me the most was he said, you know, it's, it's, it's in the vanguard, but you have to be sure to deliver. And he said, the worst thing you can do is add society to your mission and then not deliver it. And I, I uh, believe that wholly. I'm a strong supporter of what we're doing. But I'm thinking about beside curriculum, it seems to me there have to be other elements here that can help us uh, be able to deliver on that society part. And I have no idea what they are, whether they're travel or internships or experiential things, but to the extent you've had that kind of exposure, I'd really appreciate any thoughts uh, you might, and, and else as well, either of you might have on, on this particular thing. Thank you. Sure. I'll can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, it, this is, it's going to take me in a different direction than I think you're asking me to go. I, I do think unequivocally experiential learning is very meaningful. And um, I think it's important for us to build institutions that have, you know, porous walls and that we can get our students out understanding what's going on in the world around them. But a lot of them bring that into the classroom as well because of the diverse experiences they bring to bear. The place that this question honestly takes me is back to the question of corporate purpose. I emphatically, and I think that was partly why I was trying to use that, that quote from Larry Culp. He brought us back to the PNL. I think unequivocally, the most important thing that we need to deliver is that purpose is not an expression on a wall. And it's not something, I don't like the term stakeholder management. I appreciate the fact that that was the best that the business roundtable felt they could do to name what we were trying to do differently. I don't, I don't like the idea that stakeholders seems to me is not a recipe for managing better. It's kind of a confusing term. We're not sure exactly what we're talking about. I think every company is different. I think that every manager of any company of scale, of course, understands the need to multitask, pay attention to its employees today, to pay attention to its, you know, the community that provides, you know, its host, uh, you know, the importance of government is crystal clear. I don't think any of those things are a, mis a mystery for business managers. I think what we need to get clear on is what is absolutely essential for an individual enterprise to truly flourish. And what that's going to mean to different companies varies. And I just think we, we've kind of got, a, at this point, a superficial idea of what we mean about corporate purpose and the responsibilities of business. And even this tension around business and society, it evolves. It never finishes. But bringing people back to where they reside in a company, what are our intentions? What do we really need to nail down and be mostly attuned to? in order to truly ex flourish in whatever industry we're in. What in fact is our most important input or resource that we need to guard and making sure that the company is designed to achieve that. So that's gonna be different, but I think building, the, building out to these various pillars is an opportunity to think about what that might mean, but we simply have to go back to the center of the enterprise. I'm not one that believes that we can have B Corps over here and C Corps over here. I think every corporation has responsibilities to be thinking about its future and to be calculating carefully the externalities and the costs of doing business and to be able to embed that in a real kind of appreciation of who we are and what we need to achieve in order to succeed. And teaching to that idea, I think is critically important as well. Thank you, thank you very much, Judy. Uh, if I could just transition it a bit to you, Elsa, uh, it, it sounded like you were looking for such an enterprise that, that would not only could achieve a, a mission, but was aligned with your values, right? Absolutely. And, and so if you could just speak about 
what it's like to be misaligned versus aligned, because that sounds like something that was very important to you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it caused such unhappiness, and the level of unhappiness was, luckily for me, early on in my career. I mean, you know, we've all been in places that aren't quite matches, and, you know, that double line return, I can't emphasize more than enough. And even in for-profit companies, double line returns are, are now more spoken about than ever before. Um, employee retention is a big um, subject today, you know, with the re great resignation. And really what that social responsibility is to, th to the service or the product or the community that it's serving, I mean, it can't be spoken about enough. And, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, has, has been a nice surprise for me in, in just raising two, two teenage daughters was the environmental sustainability you know, and how important it is for our newer generations and, and really the focus about what it means everyday products to what we're doing to our environment and our, you know, global warming is, is something that's really prevalent. So, I mean, the component of adding society for, for, this, for this school, I think, is fundamental for business success. I can't, I can't emphasize it enough. It, it's just, it, it has to be woven up into the framework of what all business is about. And I think uh, reflecting each of your comments, it, it can't be a sidebar, right? No. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's, and to your point, uh, Judy, we want it integrated into each and every class in the appropriate manner, not as a one, you know, cor course. And, 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 and that, I think, starts to get to the heart of it, right, uh, uh, various aspects. So let's see if there are other questions or comments. Yes. And this is for Elsa, um, and it has to do with your imposter syndrome. A little closer. Sorry. So, Elsa, you discussed imposter syndrome in your early years. What do you recommend students and future graduates who may have struggles with this, who may who struggle with this, so they can overcome and flourish in business and society? So, that was um, one. You know, I, in my 20s and even in my early 30s, um, and from, the, from what I've read, it afflicts women more than men, but it afflicts all of us at some point. And I would probably gather that it afflicts, um, you know, folks of um, minority folks probably a little bit more because we're always not represented in a room all at the same time. You know, so one of my things that I felt really strongly about is, you know, getting grounded in my education and feeling very confident about my education. Um, what I love hearing today is, you know, how diversity, equity, and inclusion is going to be woven into the curriculum of society and of the business school. Um, that would have been something really helpful for me in my 20s to learn, you know, how how, how we can empower the DEI initiatives, how we can empower people that look like me, women in general, um, since you know, most, most imposter syndromes affect more women than anything. You know, it, it's an important component. I mean, I was talented, I was, I was young, but I was talented and people thankfully believed in me um, because I didn't believe in myself at the time and it was just years and years of talking to myself about you know, am I good enough? Am I worthy enough? Was this luck? Was this something that, you know, I just, you know, happened to bump into? And no, it wasn't. It was hard work and it was dedication and it was the roots of what I was, you know, taught. And it, and it, was, it was, you know, the wits, you know, about it. And, you know, giving that self-confidence, weaving DEI component into society and to the curriculum, I think would make a huge difference. You know, make a huge difference for the incoming generations now. Thank you. Uh, and in fact, at the last orientation, one of our faculty members, uh, in an impromptu way, uh, mentioned the imposter syndrome and, and characterized it. And there were a lot of heads nodding up and down. Uh, so it certainly is, uh, you know, it certainly is present. And I think as, as a school, the more we can understand it and provide support, uh, and it, uh, particularly for those who are you know, first generation students and, and that kind of thing, is crucially important. Uh, other comments and questions? Johannes. Is that on? Okay, good. Um, so, yeah, I'm Johannes Munoz. I'm teaching here at this school, uh, Global Business. And uh, so I listened to both of you and 
wanted to thank you both. First of all, it was really a pleasure to see both of those very different perspectives uh, or hear them. So while I was listening, I had the impression that one thing, one part of the discussion right now is in a sense missing, and that is the institutional side of things. Um, I just thought about you know, the institutional side of the labor market that you uh, struggled with and uh, all the, the, the corporate side that uh, you're so interested in. So just think about it, you know, if the stock market only still rewards profits, then bad companies, if they can make higher profits, can take over good companies um, that follow the societal rules um, because of their lower profit position. And so do things like the stock market is one of the institutions that we have. What kind of institutions do you think will be major obstacles for having corporations become more responsible? Uh, and uh, what kind of institutions do you think need to change so that this change in society can actually be achieved? Thank you. Judy, want to take a crack? Uh, uh, muted. Thank you. So why, why don't we go, uh, go to another question? We can't hear you, Judy, but I think they're going to work on your on your audio. Uh, uh, I think I think the issue is on our side. Is that right? Okay. Uh, I, yes. Hi. Good morning. My name is Wendy Nelson. I'm an adjunct here at the School of Business, and I love our new name and society. And a concept that kind of reminded me of your um, talk, Elsa, and your um, example was taken from Albert Bantera and um, self-efficacy. And many of my students, when we go over that um, concept, they really relate to the social modeling. And so they um, bring out that that's something that they had somebody in mind that they social modeled after to push them through and to um, motivate them to prosper. And I thought, well, what, do you have a, a person in mind that you social modeled after, and is that a concept that you um, can relate to as well? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I was very fortunately early in my career um, when I discovered nonprofit management. Um, one of the things that was a bucket list item while I was interviewing and looking at different, you know, different job opportunities was who who my boss was going to be and. What more than anything I desired was to have a woman and a person of color. And I was very fortunate enough to have two, two wonderful jobs that afforded me that. And, um, and, and those early on you know, mentors meant the world to me. You know, um, one was a Latina woman, in, I think in her early 60s, and one was an African-American woman, Faye Washington, from the YWCA. And what they taught me was these were trailblazers. These were true trailblazers. These were women that were brought up in the working world, you know, 40 years before, before then, that, you know, women weren't, you know, given the opportunities that they are given today. And, you know, these women, you know, changed what, what the working woman and what the working executive introduced the working executive. And so I really relished, you know, um, you know hearing from them you know, mimicking them, you know, trying to model myself against that. And, you know, I was, I was telling a colleague of mine last week that, you know, Faye Washington told me one time that, you know, she was in her 60s at the time, and she says, the most wonderful thing about being in your 60s is that you, you start so caring so much less. You say anything you want to say, it. you know, you go into a room and, and, and you do you. And you know, being in my 30s at the time, I was like, I cannot imagine doing that. I would be so terrified doing that. My imposter syndrome is all around me, you know. And she's like, No. She goes, Your 30s, 
you know, are a time of learning. Your 40s are a time to establish. Your 50s are a time to really try to start mentoring. Your 60s are a time to just speak of who you are and not care. You know, and I, I relish that. I think about that often. And um, it actually makes me look forward to, you know, being in the working world and growing and mentoring and, you know, hopefully teaching young others, you know, those paths and that, that building of self-confidence. So thank you for that question. That's great. And I'm sure there are people social mo modeling you right now. I hope so. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Judy, are you back on? Can you hear me again now? Yep. Okay, so I thought I'll just take a crack at the question about institutions. I mean, there's so much happening in this domain right now. Um, you know, all of the European regulators are, are leaning in, the SEC is starting to lean in, in this whole domain that's called ESG, Environment, Governance, Society. I don't think it's a perfectly captures the dynamism of what's going on with employees and a lot of other pieces of this, but it is, um, it is, forcing the question around whether or not investors are actually going to help support companies in a meaningful way to make the kinds of decisions that I think that the speaker was alluding to. You know, it's a complicated question you're asking. I think that the reason that we work at the heart of business is we believe, in fact, business is one of the most important agency, the most in line, is most aligned to the kinds of long-term questions that we're expecting from business. I don't expect that the answers are gonna come from the investors per se, but we do need regulators and we do need business to respect the rule of law in the way in which business is regulated. And so we're in a funny situation right now. I and mean, we have to look at what's been going on with um, the legislation in Washington and the degree to which business has been leaning in more to try to keep taxes low, perhaps, than to embrace the kinds of investment that we're going to need in infrastructure and climate. And so I think it's a, it's a moment where we're expecting business to step up, but we have to go back and see as business acting, business leaders, are they acting mostly in the interest of their own institution? They're being paid in stock. Let's remember the CEOs are rewarded in public companies. 60, 70, 80% of the way to their pay package is aimed at stock, so that's a key driver. We have to change some of these incentives and rules of the road inside business in order to allow institutional support to happen in the right kind of way. But I do think that the power is there to do that, and I do believe that institutions are starting to sharpen their, their own kind of interests here in investment and beyond. So that, you know, I wish I could go and off into the coffee room with you now and just kind of talk about this more thoroughly. I hope that offered some perspective on where we sit on this question. It's a very important one, the one you're asking. Great, thank you very much, uh, Judy. Uh, do we have additional comments or questions? Yes, and another, could you pull the mic down a little bit? Another question Thanks. from our live stream, and this is for Judy. Judy, which uh, indus industries do you feel which industry would focus, would benefit from focusing more on societal impacts? Which industries would focus, would benefit more from societal impacts? Or to, to reframe, you know, are there some industries that you would like to comment on in terms of either having achieved or you think it's vitally important for them to get with the, you know, with the program? Oh. I couldn't hear either you or the speaker if you're directing that at me. She can, you hear, can you hear me now? Mic. Can you hear me now? Mm, you'll speak up a little bit more. Can That's you right. hear me now? Yes. Hello. Oh, can you all hear yes. me now? <laughs> yes. We were off. <laughs> oh, well, let, let's, let's just start from the beginning this morning then. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so, uh, uh, Judy, uh, uh, the question was, are there any industries that you would like to focus on or speak about that either, I, I would say, either particularly have em, embraced or conversely, you feel like they've really got to do something uh, in order to, uh, uh, you know, I have, this I write about a lot of different companies that I think are, are, have been ahead of the curve and not because they were receiving kind of outside threats or pressure, but because the founder or the 
the kind of ethic of the company was built from the very beginning as being very centered, kind of human centered. So I write about Southwest Airlines, you know, who under a propeller for decades produced, of course, terrific returns to shareholders, but did it through putting employees at the center of the conversation. He understood, of course, that, you know, an airline, uh, like a lot of businesses, is really dependent on having superior customer service. They wanted the planes to arrive on time. He wanted people to enjoy flying. And that meant that the employees needed to enjoy coming to work. It was a very simple equation for him. There are other companies that have also done this. Another one that I would call out is Herman Miller, which from the very beginning when it first converted from being kind of a, a retail furniture store to a leader in design of furniture and, and office furnishings, um, he always put, it was also another kind of human-centered design of a company because he honored the designer. He knew that the, the road to them having a superior product was having superb design. And that put kind of the, the designer at the center. And what that meant is that Herman Miller, decades later, became a leader in sustainability before we were using the word. It was a natural outgrowth of the human-centered notion of design. And so I think there's lots of examples of that. Um, I would love to call out more. I could go on. I and mean, I think companies like Levi Strauss that have always had a, you know, from the very beginning was a kind of a family centered enterprise and, and it still has a lot of family ownership. They have, they have been ahead of the curve throughout their history, um, putting that, you know, thinking deeply about their supply chain and what are the consequences of decisions throughout. That would be another one. There are other companies that have been called to the table because of outside pressure that are superb in their in the way in which they manage some of these questions about human rights deep in the supply chain. So I will say this, they tend to be companies with brands because they are more exposed and they are more conscious of the kind of public expectations. But today the design of those companies is that they have the power to reach into their supply chains and drive change as well. So we're seeing we're seeing remarkable examples. I call out uh, McDonald's because they've been pressured by so many different campaigns that they really have turned into a leader on sustainability. So there, there are many companies like that and they change because of the force of a lot of different pressures. I think again, back to the one that's driving most of the change today is the voice of employees themselves. That's a great, optimistic <laughs> set of comments. Uh, we are just about uh, uh, running out of time. Is there, uh, uh, this would be the final question probably. There's one more live stream question and right. this is for Elsa. Elsa, how do you feel earning your MBA helped you in your career in the industry, your industry? Enormously. So, um, so I think I, I, I said, you know, I went to UCLA and I studied political science and international relations, and then I landed my first job as a finance director. And um, go figure. I was a bookkeeper in college, and I think that's what qualified me, or at least my employer thought that qualified me. And, and obviously they saw potential that I didn't see in myself at the time. But I mean, I was just like, you know, when they offered me the job, the first response I gave them, well, I'm not an accounting major. You know, which, you know, no, not the answer. Um, they said, we'll, treat, we'll teach you. But I, I, I knew that I, I needed to get formal education into finance and business and how to run, you know, proper P&Ls. And, and all that background information has, has proven and paid for itself 10 times over in my entire career. I mean, I've been pretty much focused in fi finance for 25 years and um, wouldn't change anything. But I mean, more than anything, what my MBA taught me was not just the groundwork of how to run business, but also how to manage people and how to lead efforts, which has, has gotten me, I think, where, where, where I am today. You know, it, it's not just about, you know, the one bottom line. It's not about just profitability and, you know, expending the people and the products. It's about how you can run a company and how you can run it efficiently with, you know, with with product, with profit, but also balancing the efforts of the expectations of the employees, the expectations of the consumer, and you know, and who's paying for what you're offering, you know, and that was the big piece that the MBA program taught me. Um, you know, you know, I, I mentioned my cohort. My cohort was a mix of of working adults. I, I loved, you know, and I even think about it today, you know. 
the, the great thing about an adult program was that, you know, we were all coming in with our experiences, our challenges. We shared with them, you know, exclusively. We were at, a, at an age that we weren't just in school without that, you know, world war experience. And, you know, that, that played a key role, I think, in my education. You know, it, was, it would have been too much for me to go straight into. I needed to, you know, be exposed to the challenges of being in the outside world and bring those challenges into the classroom and, and work through them, you know. And I, I think that was fundamental for me. Great, thank you. Uh, at this point, please uh, join me in thanking our two keynote speakers. <laughs> thank you, Judy, from afar. Thank you, Elsa. Uh, just a terrific set of ideas and, and perspectives. Uh, at this point, we're going to break for lunch. Uh, it, for those who are here, uh, it will be by table, and I think someone's going to go to your table. There, Angie's going to go and lead it so that we don't queue up, but just go table by table. Uh, and then uh, for those who are not here, uh, you're going to have to get you know, on Bisbo. You're, sorry, you're going to have to get your lunch. Uh, but we will return at 12.20. Uh, with uh, Steve Wu's in the afternoon uh, program, uh, which includes himself and, and uh, keynote, uh, as key speakers on different topics, and then uh, rec various recognitions. So we have a lot ahead uh, as we dig deeper into this. So uh, let's all take a well-deserved break, and we'll see you back here at 1220. Thank you. Uh, we're going to kick off the afternoon with uh, some remarks by Steve Woos, uh, who is the Interim Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and Senior International Officer here at the University of Redlands. And it's been, what, about a year or so? As yeah. A, and he's been working hard, and he's been a great partner uh, with the school and with me in launching this School of Business and Society. Uh, prior to uh, becoming interim dean, he was uh, professor of political science and associate provost of internationalization. He's also been the director of the University of Redlands Exchange Program in Salzburg. A tough job, but somebody had to do it. And, uh, and has been a longtime contributor and researcher and faculty member. And it's just been a delight to work with Steve. So please join me in welcoming Steve Woods. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see lots of friends and also lots of new people. And I'm thrilled to remove my mask. Um, it is really great to be having this event and this uh, tremendous conference around the School of Business and Society that Tom and uh, our School of Business slash School of Business and Society colleagues have been working so hard on for so long. And what I love about this development is that it uh, squarely positions business education in the liberal arts. And that's what I'm here to talk about, business and the liberal arts, as you can see uh, on the program. So I want to talk about the liberal arts and why I think they matter for our students. But first, we have to think about what they are, the liberal arts, because you know the reality is that our language doesn't really do justice to what the liberal arts is. It sounds old. It sounds stodgy. It is not always transparent to our students, whether they are undergraduate students in the College of Arts and Sciences, grad students in the college, or students in the School of Business and Society. We don't really know what that is. The labels don't do it justice. And so I thought I would talk a little bit about what we mean by that. Because sometimes we think of the liberal arts as what you study when you go to college. You're 18 years old, you go to a liberal arts college and university, uh, liberal arts and sciences university like University of Redlands, and you're going to study the liberal arts. And what does that mean? It means you're going to major in some field. For me, it was sociology and Spanish, two, maybe two fields, right? Uh, and then you're going to do some general education requirements, and you're going to have to take courses in philosophy and language and writing and math and lab science, and we're going to spread you across the college. And we think that that is good for you. We think that that broad-based education is valuable to you. 
and I think it is, but we don't always communicate exactly what the inherent value of that liberal arts education is, and I think that's really why, um, why, why this development is important, is it's seeking to make that sort of transparent. And we need to think about how the programs we offer reflect the values that we hold and the aspirations that we have for our students. And so there's an organization called the National Association of Colleges and Employers, NACE. We work a lot with NACE in the Office of Career and Professional Development. Maria's nodding, right? The other folks who have been involved as well, right? And those, NACE has these learning outcomes that are deeply, deeply, deeply anchored in the liberal arts. And so I wanted to share with you what some of them are so that we can think critically about what it means to do an undergraduate liberal arts degree or to be in a school of business and society that is so deeply anchored in the liberal arts. So what is it that we value there? We value communication, the capacity to communicate effectively. That's written, that's oral, that's non-written, that's my body skills, my persuasion abilities, right? We value education, we cultivate that in lots of different spaces, lots of different spots in our curricula. Communication, second, critical thinking. And we say critical thinking a lot, but sometimes we're not really sure what we're talking about there either, right? What does that mean? It means problem solving. The capacity to solve problems based on reason, based on logic, drawing inferences from data that are sound exercising judgment, being literate in terms of your consumption of information. Those are all skills that we hope students develop in the context of a liberal arts education. The liberal arts also has a value embedded within it. NACE emphasizes equity and inclusion, as do we at the University of Redlands, regardless of the school or college that you work in or enroll in. What does that mean? That we want our students to be seeking cross-cultural interactions, experiences. We want them to be open to diverse ideas. It's why we support study away in the College of Arts and Sciences the way that we do, and it's why the School of Business and Society has the robust travel program that it has. We think that that matters. It's not just about leaving the country, though. It's also about within the United States, being able to identify and challenge places where we see structural racism, systematic inequalities, right? We want our students to be moving through our educational programs here, ready to rise and challenge um, those kinds of barriers, right? The liberal arts is about leadership. It's about thinking innovatively. Right? How do we consume ideas? How do we formulate our, our own ideas? Part of that is being able to move beyond a simple reading of a text, say, but to challenge the text, see beyond the text. Okay? So you have to be able to, in order to be innovative, you have to go beyond traditional ways of knowing, accepted ways of knowing. You have to figure out how to learn adaptively. NACE also emphasizes professionalism. Um, that's about value, values, but it's also about accountability, it's about integrity, and it's about the drive to succeed and accomplish things. These values are why the liberal arts are critical for undergraduates and for graduate students. That's what we need to emphasize, and that's what the School of Business and Society is here to do. Right? In our programs in the College of Arts and Sciences that I oversee, we anchor deep examinations in fields, my majors in Spanish and sociology, in a liberal arts college because we think that those values, those skills, they matter for our students' long-term prospects, not just as workers, but also as citizens and people. Right? So we're building subject expertise and then cultivating values, skills, knowledge bases, and attitudes. And yeah, we hope employers want those, but we also think they're right. Our business education programs in the College of Arts and Sciences do the same. We have three undergraduate programs in the college that are deeply anchored in the liberal arts. History, law, 
They require study away. They require second language proficiency. We recognize that understanding business today requires more than accounting skills, HR knowledge, and strategic thinking. It requires that, that set of skills that a liberal arts education is able to afford you. And our School of Business and Society programs do the same. You've already been introduced to the seven pillars that are guiding programs within the school. You can see the reflection of the values that we hold for undergraduate education in the college. You see those same values in those seven pillars, right? That's what integrated sort of university life is, is about. It's about our institution's commitment to the liberal arts through and through. And it's particularly exciting, this commonality of value orientation, this shared approach to what really matters in terms of preparing our students. Because, I think you've already heard, we are now building more effective pathways for our students to move between these. So that my undergraduate students in political science or Latin American studies or international relations can study something that they're passionate about at the undergraduate level and we know, they arrive knowing that they can then move through that liberal arts undergraduate program and then continue a professional degree, an M M MBA or the MSBA in the School of Business. And s they don't have to leave those values at the door, right? They're allowed to become the person they want to be as a traditional undergraduate and then carry those commitments with them to an MBA program that isn't going to ask them to leave it at the door. This program, this school, wants students who have that set, uh, that set of value attachments to equity and inclusion, to professionalism, to integrity. We want that, right? We should all want that for our university students. And that is why, for me, I look at today as a tremendous leap forward for us as a university because what it does is signal what we value and the way that those values stretch or spread across all of our programs. Thanks. <laughs> it's a one-way street. Oh. <laughs> That's all right. All right, thank you, Steve. What an eloquent articulation of the liberal arts and its connection to professional and, and business education. As I said, he's just been a, a delight uh, to work with. So now we're going to take three slices of uh, s business and society. Uh, the first uh, slice will be on environmental sustainability and the role of GIS in promoting it. Uh, secondly, corporate social responsibility uh, and, and uh, examples of that and a student who's worked on that and now alum. Uh, and then third, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, so these are three slices of our pillars, if you will, uh, just to go a little deeper. Uh, and the lead off uh, will be Cindy Elliott uh, from, from ESRI. Uh, and she has, she's director of the Global Business and Corporate Sustainability. Uh, I've known Cindy, I guess, for almost five years now. It was just a few days, I think, after I accepted the deanship that I got a call that said, uh, from her, says, Jack Dangeman says I should talk to you. <laughs> and we, we talked. And, uh, and we've been great partners, and she's been a great partner, as we've built out our spatial business initiative and now uh, our GIS and, and society initiative. I uh, look forward to her talk, and so if you wouldn't mind uh, making your way up the one-way road here and joining us and sharing uh, uh, your perspective on GIS for a Sustainable Society. Uh, Cindy Alley. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Dean Horan, for the invitation today and for all of you for being here and helping this group celebrate because it is a time of celebration but also a time for action. And so I'll talk a little bit about that today. I do want to go on the record that I am an imposter syndrome uh, survivor. So thank you very much for giving me a name to something that I feel like I've been 
uh, interacted with a var variety of times in my career. But I am honored to be here on behalf of Esri. Uh, I think that if you know Esri, you know, we have a 50 year plus history of digitizing our planet. And our planet involves not only the land that surrounds us, but the water, the air, and the population and society. So to have this enormous value proposition to take back into the world about not only the history of our planet and our societies, but the ability to take that information and roll it forward and understand what our future holds for us as it relates to climate risk, uh, population growth. Uh, it's a very serious uh, undertaking in Esri's uh, mission so well aligned with the, the University of Redlands and the um, School of Business and Society is to create a sustainable future and that we all have a role to play. Um, Jack Dangerman is often quoted uh, or quotes this uh, statistician and conservationist from Mexico and I'm sorry I couldn't remember his name but the quote is the lack of understanding of our reality today is one of the greatest risks that our society is facing. Right? And this awareness that I'm hoping today, we, we all kind of peel back a few layers of the onion, but I want to share with you, and that understanding is that temperatures across our planet is rising. And that has a repercussion of climate risk <clears throat> across business and society. Our growing populations and the inequalities within our society will not sustain themselves if we don't have purposeful intervention soon. And we're gonna, at the, when I close today, I'll talk about the call to action to bring talent into this market that can share those. Um, but we all have a role to play, and I'll, I apologize in advance for getting on my, my soapbox a little bit, but that's what I get to do. As Dean Horan mentioned, our history goes back nearly five years. Um, it was in one of my first meetings with Jack and the directors at Esri. Uh, they brought me in to the company, recruited me from Boston, even though I'm a Redlands native, and they brought me back to Redlands and wanted the perspective of an outside business person inside Esri to really bring the voice of business into the company. And on one of my first meetings, I remember Jack standing up and kind of putting his hands on the table and said, you and Tom Haran have a mission. And the shared history that Tom and Jack have is that business and the business community is going to be critical to bringing the mindset that is necessary, the innovation that's necessary, and those resources that are necessary to impact change. And if business isn't a key stakeholder in what we're trying to solve from climate and social um, challenges, it's not going to happen. And so that's what kind of brought us here, and I think that's what um, inspired Jack to make sure I was connected with Tom. And it's been a journey. It's been a, a very purposeful driven journey. But I wanted to share three uh, stories from industry, if I could get the slide up. Just anecdotal, because I do feel like there's a critical intersection happening between business, environment, and society. And to build on Luna's double line measurement of value, I'll go so far to say there's a triple line. And I think we've also heard the triple bottom line is environmental, social, and economic. And I hope these stories demonstrate the value of those pillars that Tom talked about today, but the institutions that I believe will be pushing forward in this mission that we're all on. AT&T, quickly, um, the, they do a lot around sustainability. This particular story is around climate risk and that that they face related to sea level rise, although we're a very drought-ridden area of the country. Uh, there are parts of our country that are going to be increasingly underwater. And AT&T knows that not only to the success of their business do they need to be able to offer services, but they need to be able to connect their customers, the citizens of our society, to their families, to other services. And in times of crisis, they need to be able to serve our first responders and being able to answer you know, emergency calls and respond to um, imminent threat. And so in partnership with Esri, AT&T, and Argonne National Laboratories, they built a 50-year climate risk simulator. So they could precisely determine when and where was their infrastructure, underground and above ground, going to be at the greatest risk. So they gave them the opportunity right away to say, where should they relocate and when any of their critical infrastructure? Or where and when should they fortify and strengthen where they're at? to make sure it's stable and able to serve their community? And finally, when and where should they themselves become net zero, right, or net negative? And when, where in their operations should they be better as citizens and stewards of our environment? 
The second story, near and dear to my heart, I'm a big coffee drinker, I'm just saying. Um, Nespresso, they were actually recognized at UC 2021 with Jack Dangerman's President Award for making a difference. Um, they have a 20-year history in sustainability. They often claim they were sustainable before it was cool and on everybody's uh, lips. Uh, they believe that in protecting the biodiversity of coffee growing communities in our world will help them be a more sustainable um, uh, business, but it will also enrich the livelihoods of their farmers and the farming community. They support 140,000 co-op farmers across the globe. And there's a beautiful story online uh, for UC 2021, if you want to look it up on YouTube. Um, but they went into partnership, and someone, I think Judy mentioned earlier, the, this co-creation. So they partnered with Fair Trade and the Rainforest Alliance many years ago, using Esri's technology to go into the field and protect the land, the water, and the societies in which they're growing. And so as a result, they yield a program called the Positive Cup that only through the enrichment of the community and of the biodiversity are they able to sustain and bring positive uh, connotations and positive impact from coffee. And the last one I'll share shortly is Regions Bank, uh, maybe not a brand that you recognize here, but Regions Bank is a, um, they have 1,500 branches, this as of a couple of years ago, uh, in 12 states and 20,000 employees that live and work in the communities they serve. And after the last financial crisis, they needed to understand their business risk related to their portfolio, their economic and financial portfolios because of the downturns of those markets. And what they realized, their spatial intelligence group, during this research, was that they had completely been unaware of and, and um, ignorant of unbanked and underbanked communities. And these underbanked communities often are those that are most exploited by paid services and, and not having the financial strength and stability to advance their lives. And so they, they were able then to understand the need to go into the market and whatever, whatever method and fashion that meant to better serve them. So I think those were some great examples of what we think of as triple bottom line. And I always say I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time coming into Esri. They recruited me out of um, Boston where I had left technology in corporate America and said, I can't do this anymore. Felt very much like Luna. And when they said, come to Redlands and meet Esri, I said, no, I don't want to go back into technology. Well, the rest is history. I finally came and here I am. But I do feel like it's this opportunity to work with these global relationships and now seeing the pioneering spirit of the University of Redlands and the School of Business and Society that starts to give us indicators of what's possible and what we can all do. One of the biggest threats that we have in the conversation we're having today, and I hear it often from large global clients, is a severe gap of talent between business and geospatial and understanding the values of our society. And that they, would, they could scale and they could grow faster and they could have higher positive impacts, but they lack the talent. And they wouldn't even call it a talent gap, it's a, it's a talent deficiency. And it's not for the, I think, the, the lack of desire, but it's the lack of the right combination of learning and application and growing. And that's what kind of really led us here today. And this spans outside of geography and outside of environmental science, which continue to be critical paths of learning to help solve climate and environmental unrest and, and challenges. But it has to be kind of equally, and I think if not magnified, from our business and our organizational paths. And so whether it's retail and they're making sure that their workforce reflects the demographic of their community or that they're, um, somebody I think it might have mentioned, Judy mentioned earlier, Levi Strauss, I follow them very closely. They've tied executive or compensation to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So these institutions have to make these like remarkable statements and say we are going, this is the path we're on. And so, you know, they also, retailers like Walmart and HEB in Texas are also first responders. So they've learned through crisis and disaster that are so unfortunate in our everyday lives now that they have the, the products and the services in the stores that will serve communities during disaster. And so they use the technology and they use data-driven decision-making to know when that's going to happen and what they have to have in place and how do they serve their community. 
In manufacturing, we talked a little bit about it today, I believe there's a huge effort, and I work very close with global manufacturers, that they no longer can stand back and not pay attention to what's happening throughout their su supply chain. So they're using technology at the supplier level to make sure that a manufacturer or another supplier is not exploiting a water source or contaminating a water source, that they're exercising fair and um, uh, equitable labor. They're not, you know, you know, kind of not slave labor per se, but under, underpaid and, and you know, enforced labor. So brands, as Judy mentioned today, are having to be accountable and nice accountable. I like the fact we all should be pressuring in right, on the decisions we make every day, the products and services that we work with. Hold those companies accountable in your choices and make sure that we're doing the right thing. So I think, as I mentioned, it's way beyond, you know, the geographic and geos, uh, geology and environmental science that this program, and, and Steve mentioned it as well, is that, you know, it's going to be this infusion of understanding and awareness, as that conservationist had talked about, because we all do have to do it together. And the one limb I'll go out there on is that this learning path that we are so talking about today isn't restricted or limited to current students, right? It's the growing and emerging professional. Um, like Luna, I went back to school uh, midway through my career and got so much insight. So whether it's geospatial intelligence, business and society, learning here from the university, our emerging professionals need to continue to refresh and enrich their um, thinking because many of them did grow up, sorry, I wanted to make sure I didn't go over time. Uh, the, so much of our learning back in those days were in that old definition of the business roundtable and the, and the shareholders. So it's emerging professionals and bringing them in and creating cohorts that really strive. And I'd also say, you know, at our existing student bodies today from undergraduate and graduate levels, but let's go and expand the imagination of our K through 12. Challenge our K through 12 generation because they really are the ones that will be faced with the, the worst part of where we're at in our society today if we're not making tangible change. I think that University of Redlands is well ahead of their curve. Like I've worked with, you know, been an institution, been in uh, business for, let's just say a while, and I just continue to be excited and motivated and inspired by what's happening here at the university. I think that there's so much potential and, and I think it's untapped right now, Tom. We haven't even started to quantify the opportunity here. And that's why I'm so pleased to be here and been part of this journey. Um, I think it's innovative and very exciting. Um, but I also wanna personally thank Tom Haran for trusting me and trusting our relationship that we could be through sometimes the thick and the thins of the last five years, and I'm glad you're all here and, and participating on this journey with us now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy. She's been a terrific partner, and you can see why. Uh, always full of ideas and energy, and, uh, and we synergize, and that creates, you know, all kinds of things uh, for us and our colleagues and our students, and so we're really grateful. Uh, for the ongoing support of Cindy uh, and Esri. And you know, when Judy said, uh, you got, it's gotta be right in the center. Well, is not Esri emblematic of a, of a company that has a better world right in their center? I mean, that's their mission statement, right? And you know it from the values of Jack and Laura Dangerman down to each employee, they know what that mission is. And they've been doing just a remarkable, amazing job at executing on that mission. And we're just so lucky to have them as partners and in our community here. Next uh, speaker is uh, Stephen Bishop. Uh, he's a healthcare consultant at Acumen. Uh, he's responsible for delivering consulting projects and services in various areas of clinical laboratory management and process and so forth. Uh, he was a student here. And he's the kind of student we really like. It's what we call a double dipper. They come back. <laughs> and so St Stephen got his uh, MBA with us in 2015, and then uh, came in for a refresh uh, with our Master's of Science in Organizational Leadership. Uh, and in, during that, in the Capstone Project, he was awarded the Student Purposeful Leadership Award and now serves as a fellow of a Whitehead Leadership Society, as well as on our University of Redlands Alumni Board of Directors. So we're just so thrilled to uh, have Stephen as an alum, as a contributor, 
And uh, Stephen, very much look forward to your remarks. So please help me in welcoming Stephen Bishop. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. Yeah, I am a double alum, and it's so great to see uh, professors that I had. It almost, it almost makes me want to come back for a DBA. <laughs> Maybe. I'll have to ask my wife. Um, but you know what? Uh, thank you to uh, Dean Horan and his team for having me. It's, it's quite an honor to come back and, and to talk and share with you. So I'll just give you a little bit of information about myself. Um, I went to... Um, did my undergraduate training just five miles down the freeway at Loma Linda University. Got a bachelor's degree in clinical laboratory science. So if you're not too familiar with that, um, I basically took seven different types of chemistry classes um, and various different classes in hematology, all kinds, diagnostic microbiology. I mean, if there was a lab, a wet lab attached to it, I basically did it. So my undergraduate training was very much focused in sciences and uh, technology. And I wanted to kind of go into the industry, and I knew that if I wanted to do that, I needed a solid business education. And being in the Inland Empire, you, you have several choices, but uh, one of the things that I knew about Redlands is that Redlands trains you how to think. And I really liked that. And I, I really like what Steve Wu said earlier about thinking, because that liberal arts education is really taken into focus here at Redlands, and that's the reason I chose to come here. So I did my MBA, um, and then I finished that, and then I um, started working for a company called Acumen. Now, Acumen, we're a small company, uh, maybe about 150 to 250 employees, maybe a little bit more now. Um, but we specialize in the clinical laboratory industry, which, as the um, uh, pandemic has shown to be, uh, has put quite the spotlight on the clinical lab industry. So it's estimated right now that about 70% of your provider's decisions come from the clinical lab and the results that come out of it. And one of the things that Acumen did, being a fairly new company, very um, kind of small, but we um, made quite an impact as we have, uh, we developed a um, COVID-19 testing network. So physicians within the network could look at different hospitals and laboratories and see what the capacity was to test COVID at that lab. And if the turnaround time was too high, they could send it to a different lab. We also worked very closely in supply chain, and we were able to source a lot of critical materials for testing that could keep hospitals running. So that's just a, a little brief um, overview of Acumen and, and what we do. And, uh, but because Acumen is a relatively small company, there was no real formalized corporate social responsibility program per se. It's not to say that my company is not corporately, corporate, they're not responsible, but there was no, um, structure formal program. And so what I did in the uh, Purposeful Leadership class and in my coursework in the MSOL was I um, went out to see how I could formalize that and put together a blueprint for my company to go about doing that. Um, several of the things that I was working on, come to find out, were um, being done in parallel as I started talking to my company. So, for example, uh, I said one of the things that needs to happen from the top down is that our executive leadership team needs to revisit our mission, vision, and our values. We had made about three acquisitions in six months, which is very fast. Uh, so we had a lot of new talent coming in, new companies coming in, and uh, there was a mix of vision, mission, and values. So I said one of the first things we need to do is get the corporate uh, leadership team to review that. And the next big thing was getting... Um, not from the top down, but now from the bottom up, was to have uh, employees engaged and give them exposure and give them access to the corporate leadership team. So one of the things I came up with in my blueprint was more focused on a, um, a cultural board or a, some type of organizational culture team that would advise the executive leadership team on all kinds of um, issues culturally within the organization. So come to find out, at the same time, my company was putting that together as well. And now I'm a, a member on that team. It's called our Cultural Advocacy Board, where we work with a lot with employee engagement. We start taking up causes um, that are relevant to all of our uh, team members, um, anything from anemia management to um, different issues in patient blood management or uh, blood tube reduction, anything like that. We, we start taking those things up to our corporate leaders and what we've noticed is that over time, our engagement scores are climbing up higher. 
and higher and higher because employees are getting more um, visibility and they have the executive leadership team in a sense has a little bit more now accountability and, and both from the bottom up and from the top down now they're accountable to each other and I think one of the most important things in corporate social responsibility it really starts with accountability is who are we going to be accountable to we're going to be accountable to not only the people we drive value to but the people within our own company as well so uh, that's uh, the the gist of what I was doing with my Purposeful Leadership Award and, and Purposeful Leadership Initiative. And uh, to, to bring it full circle, that's why I really appreciate the education that I got here. It's because it didn't give me, um, it just didn't, I didn't go through a cog, so to speak. I came in, I got a lot of different ideas, I learned um, how to think differently, and was able to go out and apply that readily and I'm very appreciative of that, and um, and that's uh, that's it. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, if all the capstone projects could be as remarkable as his, uh, we will get there. <laughs> it was, the race never ends, right? And so I'm just delighted to have him now as an alum and active uh, with us. Our third speaker will take the uh, slice of diversity, inclusion, and equity. And uh, uh, Dee Dee Onhams is the Director of Business Development at, Medicare, uh, uh, at Cigna for Medicare Conversion and Translations, Transitions. She is a uh, technology process and project manager professional, and she has uh, a decade of experiences not only with uh, where she is now Cigna, but with United Health Group, as well as Kaiser Permanente where she also led the diver equity, inclusion, diversity uh, uh, activities. Uh, she is uh, an alum. Uh, she just got her master's science and organizational leadership. And we're very pleased that she has been active with us. And I'd like to invite uh, Dee Dee uh, to join us. And there she is, right here. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. So I, as the Dean just said, I participated in the Masters of Science Organizational Leadership, and I chose that because I really wanted to hone in on my organizational leadership skills. And that's because something that's near and dear to me is diversity and inclusion, and I lead a lot of programs, and I f figured if I was better as an organizational leader, this would help me. So what I want to do, similar to what Elsa did earlier today, is share a little bit about diversity and inclusion from my perspective, my experiences, um, my take. And a lot of it were learnings that I had gathered while I was part of the MSOL program. So a lot of times I get asked questions from folks of, you know, Dee Dee, why do we need diversity and inclusion programs? We had a black president. We had a black, and we have a black vice president, um, a woman. It seems like we're kind of done. So why do we actually need programs? And I think, well, that's a fair question. So what I want to do is I tell folks, I'm going to do a little bit of some historical perspective. I'm not trying to say that I'm a historian, but just a little background to give some you know, context to, to where I'm going and why I think DNI is so important. So in the 1940s, President Truman was running for office. As most know, he inherited the office when FDR passed away in office. Well, when he ran on his own, he had a platform. He had an item on his platform, and it was an anti-lynching bill. And I remember I saw this actually in a business environment. I was on a corporate business trip, and we had some free time, so some co-workers and I went to the Truman Presidential Library. And so I see this big plaque and billboard, and it talks about his platform, and I was just struck that he was actually running on something that you would think would be inherent to the heart of people, that it's wrong to lynch. He had an anti-lynching bill on his platform that, in reality, didn't even fully get passed until 2018 and 2020. So fast forward a couple of decades, 1964 Civil Rights Act, huge sweeping bills that were implemented. Again, legal legislation mandating changes that things were so wrong and a mess that we needed to be told as a society that we need to have fair practices, we need to hire in regards to, or regardless to race or gender or age. We can't have discriminatory practices. These were laws and mandates that came in. 
And then fast forward a little bit to Title IX. We have had legislation and laws throughout the years because we have had to address blatant issues. And so when folks ask, what does DNI do? What's left for DNI do to do? It really is along those more ingrained systemic issues. DNI provides an opportunity to address those things that are not as blatant as what some of this legislation was that was passed. And one of the things I do want to call out is I'm not saying that blatant issues and discriminatory, discriminatory practices don't exist, because of course they do. I mean, we all saw 2020. We saw what happened to George Floyd. We know that things are still happening. But from a corporate America perspective, a lot of what we're dealing with from a diversity and inclusion perspective is really along the lines of those more ingrained systemic issues. And DNI offers a mitigation strategy to address some of that. So how do we unpack that? What, what do we mean by that? And some of the things that I got out of the MSOL program, I thought, I'm having an aha moment. This is really great. Um, there was a change management strategy course, for example, and it was talking about how do you affect change in an organization with a team. And a lot of it, and some of the theories that we discussed, talked about technical and adaptive change. So, you know, technical change can be likened to legislation. A law is passed, but that's a technical change. If there's no change of heart, which is an adaptive change, then people may be following a law that they may or may not believe in. So the heart of DNI is to go for that adaptive change. Um, let me give another example, more at, a, at a, a micro level, about what I interpreted the difference between technical and adaptive change. At a micro level, I was working on a program for DNI, and we were doing some training and education. And I had a senior leader ask me, you know, Dee Dee, we're so busy. It's really hectic right now. We don't really have a lot of time. You know, John is really, really busy. So can we delegate? John's equity, inclusion, and diversity training to Susie. That is the description of someone performing under a technical change. They're checking a box, crossing off a list. They may or may not really uh, appreciate or approve even of what they're doing. What we want to get, again, for DNI is more of an adaptive change. So that example is something very specific to me that I thought. And as I explained when the individual asked me, I said, this is really not something that could be delegated. It's kind of like if, for example, I was delegating to one of my friends driver's ed training, but I get the driver's license. There's, you have to have engagement and partake and be part of it. So an example of adaptive change, um, going back to, to George Floyd murder in 2020, and I had a friend call me, a very close friend, she called me a few days afterwards, and it was in the middle of the day, we're all working from home, and she kept kind of beating around the bush, and I said, you know, I gotta get back to work, what's, what's going on? And she said, I just need to tell you I get it. And I said, you get what? I, I really didn't know what she was talking about. And she said, because of what happened, what she saw, she had experienced such sadness, and it, it was carrying, it was coming with her, and she felt like she had a new perspective on everything. Even the DNI stuff that we had talked about for years, she just had a different take and a perspective. And I said, wow, you had an adaptive change. I'm studying under the MSOL program, and we're literally talking about this. I want to write a paper. This is great. So it can happen. And when it does happen with DNI, and only really DNI can do that for us at this stage, adaptive change is a goal and objective. And it, you can really change the whole landscape on how we think about things. So then if we, if we have a change management process to do all of this, if we think, okay, we're gonna target an adaptive change, what, are the, what is one of the core items of some of our systemic issues? And according to the Neurological Leadership Institute, which is a large institute that has done a, a ton of research on this and works with a lot of organizations, they say a lot of the issues at the root cause of systemic issues are unconscious bias. So when I say unconscious bias, if you take a literal definition of unconscious bias, you're, Dee Dee, wait a minute, unconscious? Okay, I'm done. It's unconscious, I don't know. What am I supposed to do at this point? But what NLI, the Neurological Leadership Institution, says is that because we are cognitive beings, because we have an ability to understand and learn and grow, we can actually unpack our unconscious bias and act differently. And that's, again, where DNI comes into play. If we have organizations that are doing trainings and education around it, even if we do have 
a situation that comes into play, we can actually modify it and, and course correct. And I hope everybody's hearing me say we. I'm saying we because everyone has unconscious bias. This is not something that only one set of group of people have because it actually stems according to the Neurological Leadership Institute, a lot of smart people. It's like a physiological thing. We are beings that have to process the world around us. We have to be able to quickly take information and kind of figure out what we're gonna do next. So this is a logical thing that happens that we have these things baked into us. Now where it becomes problematic is when we take stereotypes or really inadequate information, negative information, and we use that as our go forth. So what we can do, there is a way to actually address unconscious bias, it's to unpack it, it's to educate ourselves, and then really to take a different action to it. And one last thing I wanna say about DNI and why it is really so important. It is a societal impact. We can't separate what happens outside of the workforce and think it's not going to be brought into an organization or a company, because it is. We're people that work in a company on a team and we exist outside in a, in a society as well. So it's all interrelated. And that's really one of the things that I like so much about the MSOL program. We talk a lot about the arc. The arc is this, if you can visualize it with me, you start over here and you have the self or the individual, and then you have the group or the team, and then you have the organization, and then you have society. And if you, can, if you consider it on a continuum, there is back and forth that it has to be interrelated and connected, and DNI works exactly in the same way. So organizations benefit from having DNI programs because it actually does help society. And also, there's studies that show increased productivity when there's a diverse workforce, better outcomes, and better solutioning. So to summarize, DNI is still important. Whenever anybody asks me why are we still doing it, I give them a little history lesson, and we talk about that a bit. They just love it when I do that. And then the other piece is that having a passion and interest in this and going through the MSOL program, it really helped me to understand how I can deliver some of this messaging. I, I don't like to be you know, sort of preachy about it. I wanna share the experience and share it that we all have this. I say, I think folks have heard the whole six degrees of separation. If we really think about it even differently, or one degree, if we think about the, how broad a class is when we talk about diversity and inclusion. It is gender, it is ethnicity, it is religion, it is all encompassing. So there's no one in this room that either doesn't already belong to a diverse group or knows someone and loves someone in a diverse group. So as a society, this is just something that it brings forth what we can do and how we can be better. So I thank you so much for listening to me and I encourage as a call to action, I always end with a call to action. If you're in an organization that does not have a DNI program, you can do it. You can do it whether you're an individual contributor or a leader. Please get something started. It's, it's about all of us. And if you already are in an organization that has it, sign up. It's not a scary thing. It's great and it really helps us become the better society that the, the better society that we're destined to be. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I'll invite the other two panelists uh, up, Cindy Elliott and Stephen Bishop. And also while we're doing it, you have, uh, you have lovely earrings, but they're having an issue with your headphones. So I okay. think we might get a tech person up here uh, to uh, attend to that. Uh, so we, we heard these three different uh, slices uh, of, of, of the pillar uh, and with Cindy, in terms of the professionalism of a company devoted to, uh, to environmental and social sustainability and the education that can aid that. Uh, from Stephen, uh, we heard about corporate social responsibility and, and, and actions that people can take. You know, we like to describe leadership uh, as leadership with a little L. You don't wait till you're at the top of the heap to exhibit leadership. Wherever you are, you can. Uh, be a leader for yourself, for your colleagues, and, and so forth. And, and I think that uh, uh, that's what we, uh, what we can see, right? That you can enter and really make a difference. And Dee Dee, you, you've, been, you've been at it for a while, and uh, just a masterful presentation and grounding DEI uh, as something that must uh, continue to be uh, ex thought about, executed, and so forth. And I appreciate the plug for the arc of leadership. Uh, that's mm -hmm. one of our cornerstone. Uh, <laughs> Ten dollars later, uh, and so, uh, but but you know, 
what, what it is is it gets this issue of alignment. And we heard that from Elsa and we heard that from, from Judy. How do you, for someone's values, what kind of company culture do they thrive in? And what is the connection to the mission of that company or organization? And I, I like to say, and there's always some kind of misalignment that can be worked on, right, uh, on it. But I like, I like to say, you know what's working when you know, we're driving home or something and you go, that was a really good day, working with my colleagues, getting something done, getting something done for a good reason. And I think that's what uh, we aspire to have our, uh, have the world <laughs> and our students and our community uh, engaged in. Uh, so this is an open uh, forum for a few minutes. You can ask a question of either or a, or a general uh, question. Uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about it, you know, I can throw a couple of softballs here. Uh, so uh, for each of you, uh, what skill do you think, you know, they, they always say it's, it's better to be something really good at something and make it better than to be m mediocre at something, <laughs> right? So what would you, each of you say is your key skill in making some of these changes? I'd be very interested in hearing. I know it's kind of, you want to go first? I'll go first, okay. For me, um, I have a connectivity to this work. Um, I am the youngest of six, so I have siblings that are you know, 20 years older than I am. And I'm also a child of the South. Um, I grew up in California, but I was born in Texas, and my, my siblings and family was all born in Texas, and they actually lived there and grew up. And so I have siblings that have a lot of memories of things that were quite unpleasant and hard, and I feel in a lot of ways I owe it to them to be an advocate for this. Um, my sisters, they would tell me about the, you know, going through the back doors and the separate drinking fountains. It's, it's not that far away from me, I guess is what I mean. It's not some history lesson. My living, breathing sisters actually went through it. And they're great, um, they're educators, they're a nurse, and they persevered even through very difficult times. So for me, I have a passion about it because I feel like I owe them. I'm, I'm so proud of them, and I just want to keep bringing that message forward. So I would say having a, an empathy and a passion for the work is a, is a key skill. Okay, great. Thank you. Cindy? So, very similar. I would say perception, right? Like we can teach accounting, we can teach technical skills and such. But if you're not, if a, a professional or a student or an individual can't really understand, maybe that's the word that uh, was in that quote I mentioned earlier today, that really understand and perceive reality versus assumed kind of status. I think that's what I really look for, is someone to be able to perceive and interpret what's really happening and be able to respond to that versus some kind of, you know, in, you know kind of habitual or instinctive thing that really... Uh, I think for me it was <coughs> strategic thinking, is the ability to get down very tactically and look at what's going on at the line where all of the work is happening, but also the ability to back way up and look at it from a 30,000 foot view and why it matters. Mm -hmm. And even though the concept that you're trying to apply um, might be the same, the way in which you're going to apply it and measure change is going to be a little different at each different level. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Uh, questions, comments? Online? Yep, go ahead. Thank you. I'm, uh, are we on? Martin Drayton. I'm an alumni. Um, I recently read a, a story about a university seeking an architecture professor. However, part of the hiring process included uh, a background of, or they asked about a background of diversity, inclusion, and work in diversity and inclusion. And I wanted to know if A, uh, what your thoughts were on that, even though the professor was uh, being hired in uh, architecture, the, the school, the entity did have a commitment to diversity and inclusion. And is that something that you look at um, in, res in Redlands and for the, the launch of the School of Business and Society? Tom, that was for you. <laughs> I'm being ordered to move a podium, so I, uh, there, is that right? Okay. Uh, responses? Well, we think that was you. for you. Oh, <laughs> I, I can't duck it. Uh, so, no, I got to fix the podium. Uh, so we, uh, for for a uh, couple of thoughts, uh, 
as we're going through the curriculum and looking at those seven pillars and saying, how do they apply? Sometimes the superficial can answer can be, well, it doesn't really apply in this case, right? But in some ways it does. Uh, the example I give, and then I'll, I'll get directly to what, what you're saying is, we have a new Master's of Science in Business Analytics. So what are the ethical issues? Well, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. Uh, and, and we've read about them, right? Uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, documentary that was done on uh, facial recognition that would only, can only see white people, uh, the way it was developed was pretty shocking. And the person got a dissertation on it, testified on it, and changed. And, but you would have thought databases. How can that? Well, they do. And so, so each field uh, needs to find some understanding uh, of it. Uh, and I mean, I'm not an architect, uh, but uh, uh, there's a lot of issues with architecture and architecture of different kinds. Uh, I give an example, which is not directly, but, but I just read about it. Have you re heard about this dorm at, at UC Santa Barbara? That's a, a glorified, right, $1.5 billion prison with no windows? What, what is that? What is that? Uh, and so there's, it's creating a lot of uh, I, I, you know, issues. So I think the, the simple answer is there's something somewhere in there, and it's up to that profession to unearth what it is and to include it in the training of their students. So ideally, somebody coming out of architecture school would have studied things about the history of architecture would have studied things about what happened in low-cost housing, the way it was built, and how it became, right? So I do think that every profession has an obligation to go through the exercise in, in, a, in a deep way about what is their part of this larger societal phenomenon. I don't know if others want to answer or anybody from behind. So that's my answer. So I, I'd just like to build on that a bit is that I think that um, we're long overdue for insisting on those kind of demographic or those characteristics inside all of our professions. Like if we don't start putting that bullet point in there and we don't start you know, in, insisting on, on something different, um, I think to me that's a, it's a, it's a fair and sound a requirement to put in there and I think we should all be trying to do that more and more often. Because I think we have to be intentional about the inclusion and, and not saying, oh, well, hopefully we'll get somebody with that, that skill. Like, you have to be intentional and you have to uh, hold yourself accountable. Other questions? Was there an online question? Oh, go ahead, sir. My name is Hien Nguyen, and I am an alumni. I am so proud of this university for wanting to do this. Because those seven pillars are not calmly taught. So my question as you endeavor and you embark on this endeavor is as you're teaching the skills, how are you going to empower trailblazers who will be attacked and criticized for sticking to issues that will not make money. Great question. And if any of the professors who are here want to come to the mic and give a perspective on that, that would certainly be, uh, be welcomed. Uh, I, you know, I think that when we teach things like, we heard the example of change management, uh, you know, how to engage in change in a way that is both productive uh, and also uh, through empathy but determination uh, creates enough of a, of a momentum for the change that the uh, groundswell of support uh, can help buoy the trailblazer who will inevitably, will, he or she will face critique for trying to change. Uh, so I give that one example from the organizational perspective. Carlo, are you gonna uh, step up here? Yes, I'd, 
I'd like to chime in on that particular topic. One of the things we do in our ethics class, and I teach the business ethics class, is we focus a lot on moral courage. Moral courage was one of the things that Judy spoke of earlier, and that's one of those things we, we give a lot of time to. Um, one of the things I do in my class is I ask my students, so how will you talk to power? So how will you, how, how will you voice your, 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 your decision in a way that is aligned with your value, but more importantly aligns your values with that of the organization? And sometimes, you know, um, you, you will see um, a, 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 a conflict there, but really managers really just need to be reminded about that alignment between the decision that you're making and the values of the organization. It's, you know, managers are, 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 are of a certain position where, where the subordinates or the uh, people under them may not want to uh, voice out exactly what the right thing is. And I think what we do a lot, uh, what I do a lot in my class is to tell my students, no, you have to do that. That's part of your responsibility. And in many of the cases, you know, that we've seen that I mentioned earlier in the opening remarks where these organizational scandals did emerge, what did not happen was exactly the demonstration of moral courage. And I think that is exactly what we need to, what we need to do, not only in, 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 in an ethics class, but in all of our classes, tell our students, the analytics say X. What should we do about it? And then have an interesting and fruitful conversation. Thank you. Tom, I'd like to add to that. Yep. I'd like to add to that. Sorry, and I want to give the rest of the stage uh, to. I've co I talked about three examples today. Uh, all of those companies that we saw there, and I mentioned Levi earlier today, all prestigious, high value brands. And I think we no longer are seeing the compromise of business performance to do the right thing. And I think you'll see more and more of that, and you referenced it, and I have a statistic, and I can't remember what it is, but I did a panel recently about women and diversity in supply chain, my baby. Um, and we talked about the higher performing, the more innovative companies are the ones that are higher in their diversity. By far, they outperform their competitors. And the salaries of the um, kind of personas that can come in and, and bring that to the organization, and bring that curiosity, that creativity, they're actually going to outperform and the salaries are going to outperform their competitors. So I, I feel like we don't have to make the choice anymore about performance versus doing the right thing. I, I just feel very strongly about that. And you'll see that in the brands. And, and again, in your decision making, think about that when you're, when you're um, buying and, and acquiring services as well. I know Shin is gonna ask a question, but before we do, Stephen, when you proposed your plan, it was change. What did you find was a key for it being viewed, you know, in the positive rather than, okay, what? Uh. Yeah, I think, I think the key is that the executive leadership team really does believe in the mission and the vision of, of what our company is doing. So when you bring an idea that truly aligns to that and adds value for everyone around, um, it's, it's much more easily taken. And it's, it's kind of like, um, uh, I don't want to say accepted, but it's it's just kind of like, a, oh yeah, that's that makes sense. We need to integrate this right away, because we're in a sense we're we're kind of cre we're changing how we're defining value, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that's yeah. and I think that was you know what you were getting at exactly. was we're changing how we're defining value, and then when that value starts to align with what the mission and vision is, and when that executive leadership team sees that and they're aligned with it, I mean that's that's a you're golden. That point. Great, great. Shin, is he still? Tom, I'm not asking a question. I just want to uh, respond yeah, to. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. the previous question. Uh, introduce question. yourself if you could. Oh, yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Shin Zhao. Um, I'm a faculty member here. And uh, I would like to offer what we are trying to do as a school. Um, so, what you have seen in one of the uh, seven pil pillars is the data analytics and informed decision making. So what we are trying to teach our students is that you can use data to make um, the informed decision in the way that you look at things not only from one perspective, but from multiple perspectives. So maybe the uh, goal you are seeing with a financially sounding decision, it's only the short term decision, right? So, but if you're looking at long term, it may not make sense 
in what you're doing. So to equip our students with the data analytical skills could help them feel confident what, in what they are offering to the employers, to the organizations. So I want to echo to what Cindy um, was saying earlier. So not just the bottom line of profit, but also the uh, triple bottom line is what we're teaching the students. So for example, I'm teaching marketing. And if you're looking at the evaluation of a brand, it's not only what your current customer is worth to you, but also the, pro uh, the project, you know, uh, projected value that you see in the future customers that you can gain with the, val with the um, brand that you're building. So in that sense, um, the students or the, um, you know, people who are making decisions may be attacked by the financial um, aspect on the table right now, but they need to show um, the other people, the other stakeholders, what they are contributing in the long run. So I think as a school, we're committed to tell our students, so what we are doing right now will not only benefit for the bottom line, but also benefit to the other stakeholders, to the society as a whole. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Shen. Uh, we have time for one more question or comment. Yes. My name is uh, Colin Seow, and uh, I'm, a, I'm an alumni. Um, so my question, you know, is, uh, you know, I find this, this, this uh, conference very, very interesting uh, in terms of uh, how the, all the many changes that we've seen. And one of the biggest changes that I have, I have experienced, and many of you have too, is how um, there is such a, a, a big gap of trust in all of our um, leaders, institutions, and uh, employers, and so forth, you know. And so the question, my question is, how do you move forward and demonstrate your values and share your values in this era or, or environment of distrust, when, when it seems like nobody just trusts anyone, right? And then the, the question then becomes, um, how, how do we actually maneuver and, um, and uh, handle conflicts? Um, you know, it, we've had a history in this country of, of uh, if we don't like something, we protest and uh, we will, um, you know, we'll file lawsuits and so forth. We've, we've kind of created that culture. And I thought about at, at the time when I was growing up when I saw this in the 60s, uh, I thought, wow, well, I guess that's the only way that real change happens. But then I question that today, after these years, you know, it says, well, is there another way of being able to uh, affect change, uh, especially in this era of, of distrust? Right, thank you. Anybody want to? Yeah, I was going to, I'll take a crack at it. If right. I, yeah. Well, and I think, and I, I think Didi would agree with me too, is that I think one of those things, it kind of falls under transformational leadership mm -hmm. and authentic, authenticity in, in leadership. And that's how you start gaining the trust. And that's just going to be something that's going to have to change over time because our business education is, is changing. So um, to, the, to the first question about, you know, how do you build trust? I think that's through authentic leadership. <clears throat> and then the next part of the question, Colin, what, what was the second part of the question again? How, do you, how to move forward and how to move your values. Yeah, I, I think that goes back to authentic leadership and, and you know, to um, Carlos' point earlier about having moral courage to do so. And, and I think that's why this change in, in our school of business and society is so important because we're equipping and we're training leaders to go out and do that. We're training them and equipping them to be authentic and to drive change internally. So that's my, my take on it. I, if I can, I, I completely agree. Transformational leadership, servant leadership, these are things that I learned in MSOL. And it really talks about how you create that connection with the people that are around you. And that is how you build trust and how you move forward and how you demonstrate your value is kind of walking the walk that you're talking. Um, there's nothing more dis earnest than seeing someone say something and then doing something completely different. Yeah. So it's really in your actions. Yeah, I would just add to it, you know, when we've done these workshops and such on leadership, 
one of the first things we do is we put up this slide with about 15 different values. Uh, family, right? Faith, uh, you know, and so on. And we say, pick your top three, right? And people pick their top three, and then they, they say them. And, uh, and it's about, there is, in this case, no right value, but it helps understand that people have slightly different values, different value priorities, and they can work together even though they have different value priorities. If they understand there are different value priorities out there as they go about it. My, my joke about it is I showed mine, which sounded pretty left brain, right? And I showed my wife, and she said, what? What about family? And I said, oh, sorry, I was, I was thinking about work. <laughs> so uh, uh, careful, think about that next time you get asked to fill that out. Uh, the other, the other uh, thing I would mention uh, is that these things can interrelate in a positive way, the data-driven way. For example, uh, you know, a study was done, and what three words have saved hospitals more money from lawsuits than anything else? I am sorry, right? And they found a great reduction in lawsuits for the physician taking ownership over the error. And, and so they instituted offices in healthcare establishments that use that insight, right? That data-driven insight. And it makes common sense too, right? Uh, uh, to bring parties together. So you're right, it's a complicated world and it can be fractionated but I think that there are tools and ways to uh, find that common ground uh, for change that is consistent with the mission of the organization. And if the alignment, this alignment is so strong, the, per the person will leave the organization, right? And uh, like also like you did with yours, right? And found something that's more aligned. Go ahead. One more? Yep. All right, this is from our live stream. So hopefully it will be a good wrap up question. How did, how has the pandemic affected your leadership? What did you have to do differently to ensure your vision stayed on course? Let's give each about a minute here to kind of. Had to be very creative in presentations and execution because we were remote. And um, so I really relied on connecting that way. Um, I still did outreach directly. Um, we had to do it remote, but I very much underscored certain things so, and re reinforced those things that I underscored so folks were all on the same page, but definitely using presentations and using the mediums that I had available to me. Great, thank you. Cindy. For me and my team, I would say we became a lot more human, like we saw each other inside each other's homes, you know, and um, I think we, we got, we kind of broke the barrier of, of supervisor and team. But I would also say the other thing was that we, um, the smallest little things we would acknowledge amongst ourselves and and recognize each other for work and, and still being there and showing up every day. So I feel like there was a little bit, it got simpler despite the fact that it was so chaotic. We were just very human and personal together. And I'm curious to see us, we're not back in office yet, so I'm curious to see what it'll be like when we get back in person together. Although, don't tell my company, but we were at the Redlands Bowl having lunch together. <laughs> I think for me and our company, it really forced us to start even thinking even more out of the box uh, because hospitals and health systems are already under immense pressure um, and the pandemic only exacerbated that. So it really caused us to have to go back to the drawing board and get very creative for clients um, just to give an example, we even partnered with a company and we were able to start 3D print um, swabs. If you've ever had the pleasant experience of having one of those go halfway up your brain. Um, but we did have, um, you know, that, that's an innovation that came from that. So um, it was uh, challenging, but we rose to it. And we did that by thinking creatively, creatively. And I would say for us at the School of Business, well, first, we became incredibly flexible about people and when they worked and how they worked, just because of everything that was going on. And, but secondly, we took it as an opportunity. Uh, hey, let's just create a new school. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Why not? Uh, and uh, it's true. And, we, and it really, I think, galvanized us for a positive change coming out of the pandemic. And the second thing we did is we got all the courses online in a quality way. We feel really proud about that. Yeah. And it was a remarkable achievement. It answers the question, what would it take for our courses to be online? Apparently a pandemic. And so uh, one came and we did it. And, uh, and so I think that's, that's for us. 
Uh, well, this has been a great session. I want to thank the three of you. Uh, <laughs> class dismissed. <laughs> so, uh, so now we're going to turn to spend a few minutes in giving special recognition uh, to folks here in various ways. And I want to first start by introducing uh, Keith Roberts, uh, who's going to uh, say some words about Whitehead leadership in Delta Mu Delta. Some of you know Keith Roberts retired after uh, 28 years, was it? Or 27. So is this your first retirement return to the podium? Yeah. <laughs> Although we have a lifetime contract of him singing the octamale, but you'll be spared that today. Uh, but here, do you want What a great day and what a great celebration for the new School of Business and Society. These are exciting times. But you know, we have within the School of Business a special society that we've had for since about 1986, 1987, a special society called the Whitehead Leadership Society. And so I was very excited when Tom asked me to say a few words about that society because it's a society that's very close and dear to my heart. I've been involved in a lot of the induction ceremonies. I know there's a lot of people here who are members of the Whitehead Leadership Society. And so I want to recognize those today. But first, you probably say, Whitehead Leadership Society, what is the mission of this thing? What does it do? Thanks for asking, because I brought the mission along with me. It says, the mission and purpose uh, is to encourage leadership and academic excellence within the University of Redlands School of Business, now and society. As facilitators of professional education and lifelong learning, individual members provide active service, support to the university community, foster an academic climate to enhance student achievement, focus on increasing productive student and faculty dialogue, and honor the traditions of the liberal arts. Students are nominated for this. They can be nominated for leadership in their community, in their workplace, or, or in the classroom. But it's called the Whitehead Leadership Society. Well, who is Whitehead? Whitehead was a British mathematician and philosopher who lived from 1861 to 1947. But part of his intellectual life was involved with the philosophy, philosophy of education, hence our connection to him. This is the medallion that's worn by members of the Whitehead Leadership Society. We give it to them every year during the induction ceremony. They're asked to wear it at the commencement ceremony. Those of you who have been to one of our commencement ceremonies probably recognize this. And as part of the induction ceremony, I read something called the charge, which states in part, let all know that a society of honor recognizing known achievement and proven potential for leadership is called together. They are fellows of the Whitehead Leadership Society. Yes, these are people who have demonstrated leadership, demonstrated leadership in the past, and will continue to do so in the future. They've been a very important part of our School of Business community since 1986 or 1987 and will continue to do so uh, in the future. So at this time, whether you're attending in person or whether you have logged on online to attend this uh, special event today, I would ask that members of the Whitehead Leadership Society please stand and be recognized. Come on, there's some of you out there. Come on, let's do it. Give them, give them a round of applause. <clears throat> And especially to those of you who've logged on online, I hope you stood up. So I also want to say a couple of words about this thing called the Delta Mu Delta. Uh, once we achieved a special business accreditation at the very end of 2017, the ACBSP accreditation many of you are familiar with, we then were given the opportunity to actually establish a local chapter of an international business honor society. And that was Delta Mu Delta. And I was privileged to be the founder of that, uh, of that society. And we've had four induction ceremonies uh, since, since 2018. And this is based strictly on GPA. So these are people who have achieved throughout their program to graduate in the top 10%. The top 10%. So this is the best of the best of the best kind of a thing. And it's not, it has not been unusual for WLS, Whitehead Leadership Society members. Many of them have gone on to be inducted into Delta Mu Delta. So it's a, special, it's a special society within our School of Business community. Be very important to us, and especially in the future as we go off on this. 
And so if you are attending in person or whether you've logged on online, I would ask if you are a member of Delta Mu Delta to please stand and be recognized. Anybody? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Uh, recognizing society, and it's been used in various ways, and service to society, uh, there's perhaps no greater service than to risk your life a limb for the country. And in appreciation of Veterans Day, which is today, I'd like to invite uh, Carrie Thin uh, to say a few words uh, to our active and veteran students, alumni, and community members. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Carrie Fenn, and I'm a visiting lecturer in information technology, geographic information systems, and data analytics here at the School of Business and Society. I have taught and worked for the university for the past 20 years in various capacities. And I am also proud to say that I am a veteran that served for 20 years on active duty in the United States Air Force, well before I became a professor here. I served during the first Gulf War and the Bosnian conflict, as well as during humanitarian and other military missions in many countries in Europe, the long ago former Iron Curtain uh, nations, as well as in the Pacific Theater in the Hawaiian Islands and Johnston Atoll. But it was my active duty military service that brought me to Southern California at a time for me, which was just another stop on my military tour of the world. I would like to thank all of the veterans here in the room, as well as on live stream, as well as all of the veterans that are serving or have served that are part of our greater University of Redlands community. There are many of us that serve and are also part of the University of Redlands. So thank you to all the veterans here on our day, Veterans Day 2021. We are celebrating also the announcement, of course, of the School of Business and Society and celebrating the commitment and sacrifice as of our veterans as no one does more for our nation. Veterans are slowly becoming a very small percentage of our American society since the all-volunteer force was initiated in 1974. During the draft era from 1941 to 1973, every male citizen from age 18 to 25 was expected to register for the draft. And sports athletes and celebrities such as Jackie Robinson, Elvis Presley, as well as others such as Johnny Cash, and many other average Joes fulfilled their obligation to serve. Conscientious objectors also fulfilled a moral obligation to not serve. Their commitment to not serving in military service was just as important to our society. And some of those you may know as Muhammad Ali, an American Muslim, as well as Desmond Doss, a Seventh-day Adventist. Today, however, fewer men and women serve in my honorable profession in the all-volunteer service, as it looks for better qualified and more educated members, as well as those that are younger, stronger, and more willing to serve in smaller conflicts, but for a much longer period of time. Our nation's all-volunteer force extends to the University of Redlands, where there are many doers, dreamers, and trailblazers that also happen to be veterans. Our students fill that description across our many campuses, from here at Redlands to San Diego, to those that take our courses online in hybrid programs. Society wants our veterans to be heroes and heroines, but we are not. We strive to serve our nation and our Constitution with honor. But there is also great danger in serving in conflict. As the fictitious mass character Colonel Henry Blank once said, there are certain rules of war, and those rules start with rule number one. Rule number one is that young men and women die. 
Rule number two is that doctors cannot change rule number one. And those rules were entirely too evident this past fall when 13 of my brothers and sisters were killed in the final days of the war in Afghanistan so that others could flee and fly away to freedom. Society expects veterans to serve their community, which many of us continue to do. Service was our obligation while in uniform, and while we cannot be fulfilled without continuing our service role, we serve in so many compa capacities. But we are not perfect. We do not possess superhuman abilities, nor are we all prepared to go to war. Nor are we all brave when we do go to war. We are brave because we serve with inc incredible comrades, all that share a similar purpose, a shared responsibility, and a commitment to protect each other and defend our nation. We just happen to share those ideals with the very same people that are also your brothers and sisters during peacetime. Today, we celebrate Veterans Day across our country and many other countries. Since World War I, the 11th minute of the 11th hour of the 11th day and month was a time to reflect on and thank those that served. I'm very proud of my military service, and at first I had a difficult time thinking of an appropriate response when, try, when someone tried to thank me. But now I know exactly what to say. You are welcome, and the duty and honor was all mine. Happy Veterans Day. Thank you. Very, very moving. Uh, so, um, a few other thanks are in order. Uh, are, are there still folks out in, in the other room there? Right. So, why don't you all come up front here? I would, they, there has been a crew that has been working on this for months. And so, I think I would like to start my thanks by letting them all come up here and uh, just just drape right around the front, uh, from the planning, to the programming, to the invites, to the media, to the stage, <laughs> to the web, to the invites. Well, look at this. An amazing, this is an amazing group that has made today possible. So please, join me. If you'd all like to say a few words, we can stay through dinner. <laughs> so thank you, thank you. Uh, class dismissed. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so as we uh, wrap up the day, uh, I'd like to first thank all of you for coming. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, uh, thought-provoking, I hope, inspirational day. Uh, we've been able to start at the top in terms of concepts and work our way through what it means for education, what it means for our seven pillars. What's being shown right here are all the, if it could stop for a second, are all the or, representatives from all the organizations that, uh, you know, uh, registered for this conference. Uh, some 170 different organizations, and we're just so thrilled to have such a response to what we've been putting together and thinking about. Uh, I'd like particularly thank the ones at the top. They are, they are, are in our employer network. Uh, we have agreements about, uh, you know, train, educating their employees, and you know many of them, Abbott Vascular, uh, the Audrey Museum, uh, Beer Valley Collins, Carlin College, uh, so on and so forth, Fidelity, IHP, uh, JPL, Kaiser, uh, so on and so forth, a uh, 10 year old band of uh, Indian, uh, uh, Indian, Mission Indians, Southern California Edison, 
We're very proud to be, have them in our employer network and, and very thrilled that a wider group of technology companies, nonprofit organizations, have joined today. So uh, out there in live stream world, uh, thank you very much and certainly thank uh, each of you uh, for coming. I don't have very much by way of closing comments because it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, this has been a day of celebration for us and we feel so gratified at, the, uh, at your acceptance of what we're going forward with because it is rather bold, but we're trying to be thoughtful about it and we'll appreciate your insights, your participation, and working with the faculty, the staff, the Porter trustees, the larger community uh, to make the idea of business for a better world and business and society a cornerstone to how we operate as a society. And with that, I wish you a good afternoon. Thank you.